Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea podcast where you spin the jams and spill the tea. And today is a very, very, very special day. A long time in the making. I mean, hell, at this point, almost a full fucking year. Yeah, hell yeah, Morgan. Hell yeah. Because today we are going to be talking about the Dillinger escape plan. And this is the first time in quite some length, well, a lengthy amount of time since more than two people have covered an entire discography. We did talk about stuff like we had Riley and Zach talk about Animal Collective, uh, Morgan and myself talked about Opeth, but the last time we did a uh, B-Sides episode was on the discography of the metal band Death all the way back in March of last year. So this is sort of our pseudo retrospective that we said we were going to do ever since we did our James and T quiz. When I picked this band to a retrospective slash B-sides on, we decided this would be the best way to do the band uh, justice. And yeah, we're talking finally, finally talking about the Dillinger escape plan because we've teased talking about this. The three of us have really gotten into this band over the last couple of months. Uh, just like sort of teasing it throughout the year with uh, various what we've been listening to segments. So this is a, it's been a long time coming. So uh, Riley, tell us a little bit about the Dillinger escape plan. Who who the fuck are these mad scientists? So the Dillinger escape plan are one of the most legendary uh, middle core, math core. I think math core is kind of the, the genre yeah. that they own. Um, but I mean, you can include them in lists of, of classic metalcore bands that are undeniably a part of that. Uh, they are a New Jersey, well, they were a New Jersey based band. They released six studio albums over the course of almost two decades. And so they were reasonably prolific within that time. And during that period, they, I think, were one of the most notable like alternative metal bands in the sense that they are so intense and their live performance and their studio record performances are so intense and so uh, excessive and like aggressive and sort of overwhelming listening experiences. And yet of the many bands that fit into that extensive sort of niche, they're one of the few that managed to achieve real genuine commercial success as well. And I think to take certain elements of what was happening in popular metal in the 2000s, which was kind of their prime era, and transfuse them into their particular style of mathy metal. And so that in, in tandem with the fact that as a studio album band, they're ridiculously consistent. I mean, from front to back, all of their records have plenty to celebrate. Uh, they are one of the most exciting bands to talk about as a discography. They're one of the most exciting bands in terms of their career with an alternative metal. And I mean, if you have been a fan or if you've listened to this podcast for any amount of time, you'll know that we're big, big into alternative metal, progressive metal, like all forms and variants of extreme music, um, particularly see metal. Morgan's shirt. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Band on it. So, I mean, and, as you know, as Jake has alluded, we've been fans of Dillinger for a while now and so this is sort of just been waiting for the right moment and here it is um, and so today what we're going to do is we're going to discuss and talk about uh, what characterizes and what makes each of the six Dillinger escape plan records great uh, we'll talk about the highlights we'll talk about the lineup changes we'll talk about the individual contributions of band members and then we'll sort of give an overview I guess through this process of why the Dillinger escape plan are one of the greatest metal bands certainly of the last 30 years but some might argue ever um so that that's really the goal uh we're also going to be talking about the notable release uh irony is a dead scene which yeah. is an ep that they released which is a very important step like transitionally speaking for yeah. the band uh they do have other notable ep releases uh i've listened to all of them but uh that's the one that we really want to zero in on absolutely um, we'll give the others a passing mention just because they you know exist but they're not exactly worth honing in on like an entire point they're more tangential to the album releases that they come with absolutely 
Um, and so it should be said that the band, when they formed, consisted of, uh, I believe, the sole member who has been consistent throughout the entirety of the band, Benjamin Weinman, one of the most legendary metal guitarists of his generation, one of through his work with this band primarily. Uh, you also had bassist and keyboardist Adam Dole in the band during the early period as well. Uh, frontman, first frontman, Dimitri Minakakis, whose vocal performances on their debut record, which we'll talk about imminently, are incredibly impactful. Uh, their, their first drummer, Chris Penny, uh, and I believe they had a string of other guitarists who had a role in the band of the early era as well. Derek Brantley, John Fulton, Brian Benoit. Um, but those are the kind of like three core members at this particular stage is Weinman, Dole and Minikakis. And they formed in 1997, um, actually just about a, just shortly before I was born as a matter of incidents. And they kind of quickly came together with a sound that was incredibly intense, incredibly avant-garde as well. Like it's fair to say that in terms of bands that sort of start with some of their most sort of accessible material and then kind of like go into the weeds from there, the Dillinger Escape Plan kind of have the opposite trajectory where I think they start with some of their most sort of esoteric and difficult and truly kind of adventurous and like unconventional music and they were really making an impression early on they released a three eps i believe before mm. their studio album a self-titled ep uh, a collaboration with nora and mm. a specifically probably the biggest of these releases the ep under the running board jake morgan do you have anything to say about these releases uh self-titled ep is i it, it's easily the release from the band that is the most inessential in my opinion um i would not call any of the material they're bad or lackluster it's just knowing in hindsight what the first phase of the band ended up being it feels like drafts for what would become well honestly under the running boards which is way closer to what calculating infinity ended up being i would say that that's a little bit more closer in trajectory um also a little bit more quality in my opinion uh if you like calculating infinity under the running boards is definitely worth listening to i have not heard the split ep with nora actually so i can't really speak to that personally yeah i would say that under the running board is definitely worth checking out as a sort of predecessor to calculating infinity especially if you especially if you enjoyed that record there's some deep cuts there that aren't on albums that you might want to release uh, i'm pretty fond of abe the cop which is banger goes hard mm -hmm. and so it's worth mentioning in this early stage as well that the band uh, got their name from watching a documentary on the legendary bank robber john dillinger i believe this is something the story of dillinger is something they refer to on their first ep i think so they are kind of building up steam with these early eps kind of trying to lock into a particular sound there's a great deal of chemistry between these band members and already from the get-go and i think the intense musicianship of the band is something that is readily apparent i mean as soon as you listen to any of their early releases but their first studio album is called calculating infinity and this album is released in september of 1999 and really becomes i think reasonably quickly one of the landmark releases of math core of the fusion of math rock math metal and metalcore i'm not even sure necessarily that it was a a thing at this particular point in time but this record became kind of signature in that regard morgan i think it's only fair to kind of throw over to you first because i was aware of the dillinger escape plan and i listened to one of their records many many years ago but i think it was this whole sort of fixation on this band kind of i think to my memory anyway correct me if i'm wrong kickstarted with your response to this particular album mm -hmm. what is this album like what is it about this album that really stood out to you and made you interested in this band so there there are often stories told about the creation of calculating infinity uh one of the most popular ones is that they rolled dice to decide the time signatures of the songs on it uh, <laughs> i'm pretty sure they've refuted that but the fact that that is at all plausible tells you a fair bit 
about what exactly is going on here. Essentially what this is, is I think six players on this record who know a lot about music and music theory and have a predilection for extreme music. And they want to combine those two things in the sense that they will take everything they know about music theory and do it all wrong. Bra basically break every rule of what is considered good music in order to make the most extreme metalcore influenced stuff that they could dream up. And so that's fascinating. And that continues to be what sort of is so rewarding about calculating infinity in the long run. Uh, but in terms of first impressions of the record, it's a little bit more difficult to appreciate anything beyond the fact that this is like being thrown in a, in a meat grinder. Everything on here sounds like revving chainsaws and battering trash cans. It's just the loudest thing you've ever heard when it's playing mm. and it, it hurts in a good way. <laughs> One of the things that struck me the first time I heard this record, because when I first heard this record, I was already familiar with Iron Easy Dead Scene, and I was familiar with some of the singles on their later records as well. Oh, and I was familiar with Ironworks too as an album. Uh, but one of the things that really struck me about listening to this is when I think of Dillinger Escape Plan generally, I think of this kind of irreverence, this kind of like tongue-in-cheek aspect of their music that in large part is, I think, centrally defined by Greg Pucciato, who of course didn't join the band until before the recording of their second album. And when I listen to Calculating Infinity, while absolutely yes, there is a very real sense of a band having fun and kind of like being little shits musically, uh, the predominant thing that really just captures me is how utterly harrowing this is to listen to from a musical perspective. Like there's a reverence in it, theoretically, like in terms of how the songs are composed and put together and how ridiculous it all is. But they play it on this record with a kind of like deadly seriousness that I've honestly struggled with, like uh, compared to some of their other records. Like this is taxing to listen to and it's almost willfully boisterous and like daring you to hate it at certain points as well because it's just so unabashedly abrasive and at points like so like completely flying in the face of anything approaching sort of conventional musical structure like it will it will occasionally latch onto these brilliant like little riffs and nuggets and musical ideas and then it will just kind of toss them out the window in favor of just pure cacophony but that said once you adjust to this and I mean it might take you have to decide you really want to get into the Dillinger escape plan I think to really be able to give this record the attention it needs because it might take four or five listens before you're even able to start comprehending what these songs are doing on a musical level above and beyond just bashing you over the head it's a very willfully mean album oh yeah i would describe it as antagonistic most of the time yeah what about you jake what are your thoughts and your experience with this album in many ways i almost think this is the single worst place to start with the dillinger escape plan in that it's like obviously there's the uh, the the lineup change and the introduction of uh the longer time frontman greg pucciato after this which it's really more tangential to my designation and really that like the the musical avenues that they explore later are just a little bit more like when it comes to extreme music the singular ideas that they pursue are a little bit more accessible and easy to grab onto and really the the magic of later dillinger albums is how they synthesize all of these singular ideas into a greater whole which ends up being wholly unique to them um, whereas this, I think Morgan said it best when like the, like the thing that made me interested in listening to this band was him saying that he listened to this and he said it was like 
free jazz by way of metalcore. And that's the best way to describe this. I think that like when listening to this, it's one of the most aptly titled metal albums I've ever heard, Calculating Infinity. It's like the band has gone on to say that like they've, they write about um, a lot of these uh, records end up being sort of about um, the idea of interpersonal relationships, uh, abuse, violence, sexual violence, uh, just kind of purely id driven stuff. Um, but also the idea of calculating infinity being like, how long can we measure this thing? The thing in this case being love until, you know, we break. And just the notion of calculating infinity, it feels like there, there's definitely that it's, it's ugly. It's challenging. It's, it's all those things. Um, but the two things that keep it or like mostly afloat to me that make me like gravitate towards this release as being like a genuinely exceptional album are the fact that the musicianship is always obviously excellent. Like there's never a moment where the ugliness stands in stark contrast to your ability to recognize the sheer power of the instruments happening here. This is like, this is a band where I would describe the guitar work to be more like, the guitar work is funny because I would describe the way it's used as like most metal bands, they're kind of guitar driven and they use the drums as a spine. Whereas this band kind of is more rhythmically driven by its drums and they use the guitar to like also act as rhythm rather than like channeling melody, which is really more of a like, they kind of just ease into the structure of that. It's it, like, even on the opener, Sugar Coated Sour, this is like, you know, they do some wacky chord progression shits at the start of this. And then to sort of ease into this like really, really intense soloing. And then they go into um, surprisingly like catchy uh, chorus took the take a bow you deserve it eat shit you've earned it like it, it has enough for you to latch on to but it, it's like it stands in contrast of like even though they changed frontmen later it has the same sort of appeal of being like really super fucking ugly and intense and then going into something that really lets you to like just sort of lean into how hard it's going but it gives you a melodic idea or or a song or a lyrical kind of hook but the cool thing about this album to me is the idea of like the calculating infinity which i think translates into this sonically because like this to say this is just like a metalcore or mathcore album almost does it an injustice i think there's really something to that sort of jazz comparison is that constantly you sort of feel like these songs are like like the Dillinger Escape Plan is a band that like we once said about the Mars Volta album Bedlam and Goliath that it sounds like the 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 people playing these instruments are trying to actively like explode and break them while they're performing. This entire band is based around the concept of doing exactly that. And it feels like this album in particular is trying to reach a level of cosmic transcendence. Like from the first couple songs, you just sort of feel that intense rhythm and that intense breakdown beat down time signature wacky wonky shit but like starting on like the fourth track which is the like pound sign instrumental thing the, the sound starts to go beyond what it, it's hinting at something further like the sort of like the keyboards play a little bit more of a um a major player here and there's like they they sort of toy with like atmospherics and like ambience and stuff which makes this album that came out before the turn of the century sound like something that would be more of an endeavor from the 2010s it's it's an amazingly like aged album it sounds timeless to me um but these like hints of like they're like you know they're they're fiery they're they're breaking everything down and eventually they just sort of get to this point where the songs will more regularly uh, sort of reach this kind of atmospheric blanketness that's like very traditionally beautiful sounding, but also just sort of like keeps like hinting back. Like the structure of this album is remarkable to me because it sort of like eases you into that and you sort of feel like you're being like, your head is being dunked into this like fucking place where you can sort of see the entire matrix, the sort of code or whatever. And it sounds amazing. Like, uh, 
uh, shit like clip the apex except in, except instruction is one of my favorite dillinger escape plan songs because it does that so well especially uh you know followed by calculating infinity the title track the, the way it sort of progresses by balancing these two ideas of the ugliness and the transcendence that's here is just an endlessly fascinating and appealing idea to me and yeah this is definitely a different record from where they would go uh sonically and it, it's in many ways the biggest outlier of their entire discography, but the spirit is there. It's just the means by which they achieve it. I, I'd say that albums like Dissociation and uh, Miss Machine do share a lot of common, like commonalities with the sound. They just kind of go about rearranging it in a couple of different and slightly more accessible ways. Uh, but it's easy to see why this has the legendary status that it does. Um, I, I'm very enamored with it. It's not a love at first listen. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure I did, but like not as much as I do now. But every time I, I come back to this, I'm struck with how ugly and mean and nasty it is. And I'm a musical masochist. I like being tossed around. I like how I, I just like how aggressive it is. And there's nothing I've heard that gives so little of a shit as to the listener's well-being as this does like not even this discography there's nothing quite this unfriendly and that is precisely why i like it this much there is definitely something to be said for records that exist purely as these examples of extremes and there's something enticing about those records as well like on the podcast um on the main episode of the podcast uh earlier this week I talked about an Olvera record called Natin's Madrigal mm. and one of the things I talked about when I was talking about how enamored I am with that record is how extreme it sounds now that's more an issue of like extremity in production than extremity in musical construction but there was but the primary appeal of that record to me even though the compositions are amazing is the extremity of the production it becomes this fascinating kind of enigmatic thing that you feel like you can conquer but through the experience of listening to it but it also it, pre it presents challenges to you it dares you to try and conquer it it dares you to try and understand it and i think that's even truer of a record like calculating infinity it and it's the record more so than any other dillinger record that i really have to be in a particular mood to listen to it's probably the dillinger record that i get the least personal fulfillment from um, and I think I've seen some of the sentiment expressed online where it's like some Dillinger Escape Plan fans are kind of in, divided into camps where it's like you prefer the kind of inhuman howl of what Dimitri does and what the band are locked into on this record versus the more kind of irreverent but equally sort of fiery um, variation and like different kinds of complexity that the band would kind of get into once Greg had joined. And, and of course, there are Dillinger fans that like both. I mean, we have two of them here at least and I do enjoy this record I think it is very good I think it's a very impressive achievement there are points at which I feel it is more impressive than enjoyable um but then again there are plenty of records that are like not enjoyable on a on some level yet have this greatness to them that entices you back to them that has you kind of in awe of them even if you find them to be kind of difficult and and unwieldy and unruly that said, though, there are highlights here uh, that I love that I want to shout out. Jake's already kind of really talked about one of my favorites here, which is Clip the Apex. I love the way that this song iterates through these various kind of chugging riffs that you can kind of just get lost in. It has one of the coolest breakdown sections on the album as well. This band is Filthy. so good at like... Just disgusting. <laughs> This band is so good at just kind of pummeling you with these high intensity, high speed sections of riffage and then just inserting these breakdowns that feel both like they don't feel like a release from the tension like a breakdown might typically feel. They feel somehow even more upsetting uh, and Clip the Apex does that beautifully. I like the way the song kind of just evades your grasp by just kind of breaking itself apart in the second half. That's actually something that a few Dillinger songs do, but not a lot, I would say. And I, I, I really like the way that the song just kind of disintegrates into static noise and then like has this great mm -hmm. transition of a hard cut into the title track that's just awesome. Yeah, and that's a moment as well when that happens that you get a nice juxtaposition between what the album does so well in terms of texture, which is all the noisy, loud, intense stuff, and what the album does so well in terms of rhythm, which is the 
rhythm section of this record which has to be shouted out i think wyman actually plays the bass on this recording and he of does. course chris penny is the drummer in this early era um i mean what the stuff that penny is doing on this record is it's it shouldn't be loud it, it, it's borderline I, I imagine him with dr octopus arms while drumming this album because that's the only way it seems feasible yeah he just has this sense of like what again that's the thing that really gets me about this album is how well these men are able to match each other and but have their own kind of personality in terms of how they express themselves i think probably the best song on this album is 43 percent burnt i think it has all of the strengths of the album at their most ferocious and deranged uh it piles on the intensity of its repetition but it also as has been mentioned uses that repetition to be kind of weirdly musically catchy despite itself eventually it's kind of just cycling through this i love the way this band will sometimes use just detune the guitar for a riff and it will just sound really kind of like just uh dissonant and ugly um and it has this interesting production decision which is to fade the song out slowly uh yeah. which is something that the band obviously don't do very often but has a strange effect here where normally i'd be critical of that kind of decision but it when you're in the context of this record, it feels like the band are kind of stuck into this sort of hypnotic state where they're just doing this groove over and over and over. And, and like you, you get the feeling that they might be stuck in it forever. And that's another aspect of the record that I really respond to is this feeling that you, <laughs> when you listen, like this might sound silly, but sometimes when you listen, it's like you, you can't be sure this was made by human beings. Like you wonder whether you're listening to the work of some kind of even more intelligent design that is like creating these. It's primordial. Yeah, like... and I know that can can sound a bit ridiculous and maybe even a bit pretentious, but like it, it it's a, it's a it's a specific vibe that is exclusive to this record where I feel the strength and it, and it's really accentuated by the fact that Dimitri's vocal performances are almost universally just howls and screams that are barely like they're just he's very monotone of a performer compared to someone like Greg Pucciato and that gives this record's ferocity a particular kind of like inhuman feel um and that is an aspect of the record that I do really really respond to I want to shout out my uh two two of my favorite songs on the album but also a contender for I, I in any lesser band, I would say that this is the best three track run of their discography, but it, it, it simply isn't just because this band has a lot of those. Um, but the final three tracks on here, fourth grade dropout, weekend sex change and variations on a cocktail dress are just like this is as much as I enjoy this band. Uh, fourth grade dropout is just absolutely one of the most ferocious things that this band has ever made. Uh, like it, it even starts to offend some of my sensibilities, which I would be I would be hard pressed to say that I am anything short of more than willing to prostrate myself before bands willing to inflict pain um which is why this is a, a masterpiece of a song but then yeah. you go into weekend sex change which is my favorite song on this album which is basically nothing but the drummer losing his damn mind and also some of the most dark heavy atmospherics on this record just absolutely you're just kind of entrenched in them and you feel kind of lost and adrift and like right after uh fourth grade dropout this feels like the sort of like it, it feels like that is the song where you get the shit beaten out of you by like 50 people and then this is you slowly coming to in the hospital and then at the very end you have variations on a cocktail dress which is just like hey did you think fourth grade dropout was too much well here's that but like twice as hard uh and i also just i'm a real sucker for the part in weekend sex change where it's kind of like the the drumming is a real focus of the first part the atmospherics is sort of the the second part and then the final part is doubling up on the tempo of the drums in the first part and just sort of like goes and goes and goes and goes the band do that a lot later too but i am always a sucker for it uh shout out to limerent death a song that also does and has this exact same structure and is similarly harrowing because of it yeah i mean limerent death I, I, i'm almost certain they do that because like last album they do a few things that feel like coming full circle and um just on the note of that final uh, trio of songs the one that really stands out to me is fourth grade dropout which co-sign everything you say about it in many ways this is kind of the most upsetting song on the album like not even just sonically as well but I mean one thing we haven't really mentioned is the lyricism on this record which is 
like it's straight like psychopathic at points like it it, <laughs> it, it has this tenor of like of, of this sort of nihilistic creature or person who has nothing but hate in his heart for every human being or every living thing that he encounters who feels this perpetual sense of betrayal and distrust and I mean it's not something that's unique to this record but it's particularly ugly on this album and you have lyrics that and this song in particular is where it really leapt out at me with lyrics like uh, swing the chair, pounding my brain, love her and tell her, fuck her and smell her, don't fall for it, don't fall for me. The chain link fence surrounds the feeble child, gag your mouth to hear sweet melodies. Like there's this really seedy quality to some of the lyrics in here. And I think it's it's deeply upsetting in a way that obviously works for the kind of record that this is. Uh, and, and what I love about the song is that the band matched some of the most upsetting lyricism on the record with this atmosphere and arrangement that's weirdly moody and suspended. There's even these ominous synths during the clean breakdown part of the song that add this really thick atmosphere of dread so that when the band sort of turn up the intensity at the finale of the song and Dimitri comes back and screaming, it feels like genuinely upsetting in a way that is somehow even new for the record up to this point um and i also want to say on the note of weekend sex change the synths in that song uh very heavily evoked twin peaks for me so yeah that's just the thought that i yeah. had morgan what are some of your favorite tracks on this record and like individual musical moments that stand out to you well i'm gonna second that 43 percent burnt is the best thing here it's probably Dillinger's most famous song yeah. or whatever that means exactly. It's like the ultimate distillation of what makes this record great, I think. If you were going to pick anything to show someone what Calculating Infinity is like, I think you would go to 43% Burnt. I mean, it might not be the most intense thing here, but it's the most gratifying I think really just the mm. first three songs are uh, like on the exact same level almost in that sense of just starting you off on the wrong foot of music. <laughs> um, mm. That's another thing I wanted to talk about though, is that I, I see what you mean when you say that this is probably the worst place to start with Dillinger. I think it's probably the best because it's all easier from here. Uh, so if you, like, if you can take something from calculating infinity, you will probably take something, if not more from every record that comes after it. It's very much getting thrown in at the deep end, but like, you know, there's no shallow end for this band. So what do you want from me? Yeah. Um, I will say as well, another thing I haven't mentioned is that obviously this record, as part of its disorienting, like all over the place, musical construction introduces um, something that Dillinger will go on to do uh, even more immaculately and integrate into their songs even more immaculately, which is their immense talent for actual clean sections of music, which you get mm. on songs like Destro's Secret and The Running Board. Uh, where you show we have like songs. beautifully kind of lyrical guitar work and the kind of um arpeggiated chords and just that the running board in particular had has, has a kind of westerny feel to it uh, and it's clean section that I, I really kind of dug and um this sort of sense of disorientation a big part of that is the fact that the band will launch into stuff like this without any warning and they'll continue to do that on subsequent records in ways that I think get even more and more uh, gratifying as you say and and yeah it's just like everything uh, instrumentally that you could want from the Dillinger escape plan is here and they would go to refine it and add and make it more accessible from this point onwards also worth noting the recording of this was somewhat primitive and i don't mean that in the respect of the the, the quality which is this this is an in again incredible sounding album uh there the the texture here is just absolutely unparalleled what i mean by that is that like this 
all on like a single tape. Like they they needed to do all of this at once. This isn't something that they recorded the individual instruments of and then pieced together later. And what they would do in the recording of this is that if they slipped up or did a note wrong or something was dissonant, they would take that and build upon it subsequently. Like if something was ugly or wrong, they were encouraged to play upon that, which is again, why this kicks so much fucking ass and ends up sounding so fucking consciousness elevating at times is that it feels wrong and I like it. I, yeah. I like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. And just one more thing that I will mention is this is the only time we're going to be able to talk about Dimitri Minakakis. and yes, more one note than Greg Pucciato. The man sounds like he is being flayed alive during the recording. It like, sounds like he is in legitimate pain, and he probably was considering that he had. I mean, this is not a way to perform music in a sustainable way. That's part of the reason that he departed from the group. But what that lends the record is a sort of entirely unhinged mode for all of its 38 minutes mr minicacus knows how to fucking make me feel like i am jack being led by verge down to hell at the end <laughs> of the house that jack built I, I love i love like this is the only um podcast where the house that jack built will be invoked in the context of discussing a, a, a math core band, love it. The other thing, of course, that Dimitri, in retrospect, having left the band, like what that does for this record is it lends it a, spe a specific uniqueness. Like you get a particular thing from this record that you can't get from other Dillinger Escape Plan records, which is not necessarily true of, of any other Dillinger Escape Plan record. There's at least some overlap between more multiple of the rest of their records, whereas this is kind of really singular in a particular way. It's glad that we have it as the the exercise and maximalism that it is. Yeah, like it's it's just yeah. nice to know that we have this. As you mentioned, Morgan Minakakis did depart from the band um, shortly after the release of this record. Uh, it's also worth noting that one of the first person, one of the first people that the band played this record to, was Faith No More vocalist Mike Patton who immediately invited the band to tour with Mr. Bungle in the aftermath of this record. This must have been around the time. Maybe the most touring. important thing that happened to this band bar the introduction of Greg. I mean, yeah, this must be like around the time that Bungle are touring California as well. So that's like, imagine mm -hmm. that tour, California and calculating Infinity Live. Man. So much acid. Meeting Mike Patton is basically like the Beatles meeting Bob Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> but for extreme music <laughs> i mean yeah and i mean it would prove to be an incredibly fruitful if short creative partnership and the most notable result of which well the sole result of which really is the 2002 ep irony is a dead scene which um was the product of a growing kind of interest from mike Patton and the band a relationship between mike Patton and the band members the fact that dimitri minikakis had stepped away from the band the band were kind of in the process of figuring out their next move and their tours with Patton had been incredibly successful. And so they came together in the studio and recorded the Irony is a Dead Scene EP, which came out in August of 2002 is credited to, credited to the Dillinger Escape Plan with Mike Patton so that there's no uncertainty that Mike Patton is not in the band. He's just kind of acting as their interim lead singer. Um, I'm still a little frosty that we didn't get like a full album out of this collaboration, but it's hard to really be feeling that ungrateful when you have an EP that is as, as significant as this. Um, to me, if I had any issues with the overall structure and coherence and kind of connection of a record like Calculating Infinity to me personally, that those difficulties and that absence is not something that I feel with the irony of the dead scene EP. And a part of that is because it's, this was the first under escape plan project that I ever heard. Part of it is because I have a, a 
a very strong affinity for Mike Patton. I find him to be one of the most compelling musical presences of his generation. And also part of it is the fact that, holy shit, these songs are unreal. You have three original new songs on this record and they all fucking crush. You have none of the brief kind of interstitial tracks here. You just have three wholesome, just packed with idiosyncratic detail and musical genius songs. I mean, this is one of my favorite EPs of all time. I, like, th- I'm throwing all my cards on the table here. This is like, again, M- Morgan put it best when he talked about listening to this in the What We've Been Listening To segment where he was just like, the only reason I did not give this album perfect marks is because there needed to be more of it. And hey, it goes to your complaint to Rally that we, you know, still frosty that we didn't get another album. Like, and it's like, yeah, I, I do. And the reason I say that Calculating Infinity may not be the best place to start, even though I do think there's certainly some merit to the whole, you know, throwing you in the deep end approach is that I actually think this is the thing most people should listen to to get into this band, um, which is weird just because, you know, it's a four song long EP with a guy who is only the front man on this EP, but it manages to sort of capture, like, this is the missing link in between the, the two most distinct eras of the band is that Mike and Greg Pucciato have virtually everything in common in terms of their presence, but this also definitely has like the earlier sound of something like Calculating Infinity. It's just that the song construction is noticeably more recognizable. I mean, from the first song, Hollywood Squares, you have like the first lyrical passage, which is just Mike screaming just fucking like ah, oh, what? and then immediately it goes into him doing his weird bjork medulla you can't understand what this motherfucker is saying and it's so cool and can't understand it but he's spitting he the whole fucking all 18 minutes of this is nothing but him spitting and i'll let you all speak as to the other songs here uh this is probably a slightly unpopular opinion but i hold it nonetheless is that my favorite song on here is actually the cover of come to daddy i just i can't this is like one of the most addictive dillinger songs to me this is one of the most ones i've re-listened to the most i i i can't get enough of the the delicious delivery of i want your soul from mike Patton. you can you can feel the smile on this man's face from behind the mic as he said this shit and it's so menacing and evil sounding and it goes so stupid like oh my god this the the amazing thing about this band and their many influences is that across the entirety of this discography there is influence from idm all over it so it's really only natural that they would do something as fucking wacky as covering Aphex twin jake, i mean have like you, have you heard the original song jake out of curiosity yes i have okay cool. um it's it, it and like it's weird because i heard it after this uh, which leads me to slightly prefer this but like there's something to be said when a band is so adventurous that they cover i mean i mean this is like if like fucking i don't know if porcupine tree covered like a whitney houston song like i don't fucking know it's so it's so like galaxy brained that you're just kind of like they they did that cool Um, i i like the the cheek of the come to daddy cover i think it is probably pretty handily my least favorite thing on this ep Um, But it kind of works because of Mike Patton and the way that he's able to kind of, he's able to do this song and make it feel obvious that he should always have been the person singing this song from now on. (laughs) What's what's doubly funny about it is that the original song by Aphex Twin was always intended as a joke song, was written particularly, Hmm. I think, as a parody of metal. Uh, and was kind of like a specific kind of like really sort of extreme but kind of two-dimensional and shallow metal um, that was um, all over the radio at the time. Which is only appropriate that Mike Patton of all people cover it. Yeah, exactly. Parodying a parody. I mean. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it's the first real moment in the Dillinger Escape Plan discography, I think, where you get this actual sense of how much this band are comfortable with poking fun at themselves as well, and don't really take themselves too seriously. 
um, like I said with Calculating Infinity, that record's dead face seriousness is part of what makes it work on the whole for what it is. But I definitely respond more to the lashes of kind of irreverent silliness that color the rest of their releases to a smaller or greater extent, depending on where you're focusing. Um, Hollywood Squares, I mean, I co-sign everything that was said about that. I mean, Patton locks into these deranged vocal performances with fearless abandon. He relishes the challenge of keeping up with his band and even matching them. And he uses his incredible voice both powerfully and texturally to act as the perfect sort of cheery on top of these arrangements. Automatically from this track, I think you have a slight increase in proclivity towards hooky instrumental parts where bands will where the band will linger on something a really sort of catchy musical motif for longer than they would have on the debut album for the most part and this gets even more pronounced with pig latin which has these kind of pretty picked guitar melodies that open the song alongside some really tuneful singing from Mike Patton before the breakdown really kicks in. And I'm sure I was not the only person who was reminded of System of the Down uh, with this nope. particular song. I think there's a clear bit of influence there, but also it's kind of like Patton's been doing, Patton kind of invented this whole thing anyway. But the uh, chinga, chinga in between the <laughs> super like... Um, <laughs> I, feel I, should, I should have had the lyrics up there, but that's essentially how it reads. Um, it has this truly um, Mr. Bungle-esque slower section as well, where it kind of gets very sort of dark, but also like stupid as well, because Patton is singing about like tying your legs down and fucking your brains out and waving to the crowd. Like... This man is a born performer and like this is everything you would expect and want from a Dillinger Escape Plan song featuring Mike Patton. I mean, if anything, it's more Mike Patton than Dillinger Escape Plan, which is certainly not true of my favorite song on this record where the two personalities are matched perfectly. And that is, of course, when good dogs do bad things. Um, I'll, I'll let Morgan talk about this first because I know this is a song that Morgan really, really loves. But all I want to say off the bat is, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. Oh no. Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. See, this is where the Mother. irreverence of this band really starts to become more prominent. And in many ways, it never really surpassed this um, in terms of just pure fucking. <laughs> type shit it helps that it's like i i don't want to say easily i don't want to be that flippant about it but it's like clearly to me the most interesting thing at all levels that this band has done up until this point just a, like an absolute towering achievement for this band in every sense pretty much I completely agree. And the fact that the piece is like six minutes long as well, you have like so much happening and none of it, and it's so fast, but none of it really feels rushed or none of it feels like it's too focused on just bashing your head in. But Patton, like I want, the one thing I want to show about this track is the lyricism, because that's something that we can often like sort of put in the background while we talk about the musicality but the lyricism here is so fucking funny like this is probably the funniest song in this entire discography and it's purely because of Mike Patton obviously um you have lot these so essentially it's like a song that uh on the face of it covers this topic which is kind of boilerplate for this band which is a scorned lover who loses his mind with grief and jealousy at his partner's betrayal um but what's beautiful about it is that Patton has these like surprisingly evocative lyrics um and I mean that genuinely and sincerely like roses floating out with the tide dance and sing under gunfire a smiling drunk nursing a glass of milk a girl with a face like prison bread. Like, these are that's, really... That sounds like Tom fucking Waits. Like, <laughs> like that um, shit would be on Mule Variations. Yeah. It, not, it's... Not, not, not a distant relative of this band lyrically. No. You, you, you know? And you then have my favorite lyric of on this song. Um, one of my favorite lyrics that Mike Pat Patton's ever written, actually, which is, in this crowded place, I could swing a cat and not even hit a soul. 
<laughs> Which that is <laughs> the most glorious mental image ever. Just Pat- cat by the tail, Mike Patton being like, fuck shit, fuck. Patton's vocal choices here as well are fucking hilarious. He just veers from leery, lecherous weirdo to inhuman creature screaming so loud that his voice has just rendered a wall of static, especially with the way that the vocal production is done on this particular track as well. You get this soulfulness and then you get this just kind of like fucking rain of static as, and how in terms of how his voice is rendered. And yeah, it's just like... It, it, it's unreal. I, I I think this is, yeah, I agree with everything Morgan said about this being the most fascinating song up to this point. I'll go a step further and say it's my favorite song the band made up to this point. Uh, really just I, yeah, adore I would, this shit. I would, I would second that. There we are. The, 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 the hard thing about rating EPs in particular, uh, because this is just what we do, we catalog is like the best EPs a lot of the times suffer from the fact that they feel like they should be albums. But like you almost have to consider it within the space of the band's career arc where it's like this is the only place that these four or five songs fit is on this EP. And that is uh, exceedingly rare because when the songs are that good, you typically want an entire album spun out of it. In 2004, we have the band's second studio record, which is made after the hiring of Greg Pucciato into the band, who becomes the replacement vocalist. Um, You know what? One interesting fact is that the band, I believe, originally planned to record this album with Patton, at least if Wikipedia is to be believed. But like in the sense that he was the... um, stand in if we can't find another front man but they did find Pucciato and I think that's for the best as well because you don't necessarily want this band to become uh, too sucked into the shadow of bands like Faith No More and Mr Bunkle and also Pucciato gets a lot of comps to to Mike Patton but it should really be emphasized he's very much his own performer and he's certainly very much his own writer as well and he is pretty uh-huh. much his own vision for the for this band and together with the band Pucciato I think and and his new bandmates start to envision like concepts and ideas for records that get more sort of ambitious that get more sort of far-reaching that get more colorful uh, than you might expect purely on the basis of calculating infinity and so in a weird way 2004's Miss Machine is kind of like the the kind of result you would expect from the band that made Calculating Infinity and the band that made Irony is a Dead Scene, but not the band that would have made any of those in isolation, if you get what I mean. Like it's it's kind of has elements of both of those releases, but fully realized into this form that truly represents Dillinger Escape Plan Mark II, the second era of this band. I'll talk about Unretrofied, which uh, mm-hmm. is one of the singles from this release and easily the most out of this band's comfort zone for yes. anything that they've done so far in that it is friendly at all. Greg Pucciato has talked about the creation of it, and he specifically cites Retro Vertigo by Mr. Bungle as like he wanted to create yeah. something that made him feel like that song does. It's just one of those moments in this band's career where you're like, I should have known that they could do this. I just never expected them to want to. And like, it works perfectly in that it is friendly, but it's also the second to last track on the album. So you've had to wade through some, some shit to get to it. Like this is because like I think Miss Machine is where this band starts to get kind of like truly gray matter expanding instead of like just tossing you into the meat grinder. Yeah. Um like with that first your soul leaving the meat grinder. (laughs) With that first record, you kind of don't really know what to make of this band. And this record is kind of bewildering too in certain senses, but you start to get a fuller sense of of like the kind of music this band is trying to make and what their real sort of strengths are. Um, like they balance 
some material that is incredibly heavy and familiar and sound to what they've already done with songs like Unretrified, with songs like Setting Fire to Sleeping Giants, with songs like Phone Home, which are comparatively more accessible for this band, um, but still don't betray the sense of heft and the sense of complexity in terms of musical construction you would expect from them. I think it's telling that on the um, deluxe sort of Japanese edition of this band, there are two bonus tracks, both of which are covers. And I think it's telling that the two songs they chose to cover, uh, one of which is Damaged by Black Flag, um, and the other of which is My Michelle by Guns N' Roses. And I I've not heard either of these. I fuck. That sounds awesome. Uh, I uh, <clears throat> my favorite shirt of theirs that I've seen is one that's just the Guns N' Roses logo, but they have Dillinger Escape Plan on the bullet instead of Guns N' Roses. <laughs> <laughs> that's and so again, sick. It speaks to the band's sense of humor. It speaks to the band's like irreverence and willingness to kind of poke fun at themselves and to poke fun at the fact that in hiring Greg Pucciato and Greg Pucciato kind of coming to be a front man of this band and delivering vocal performances that are much more akin to like alternative metal and like more sort of popular forms of metal in the sort of late nineties and early two thousands, you get this different sort of vibe coming off of them to a certain extent. And they lean into that. I mean, you start to get, like I said, more commercially friendly songs that still kind of pack some hidden punches within them that, I think will have expanded the brains of people who encountered them uh, in isolation. You listen to something like setting fire to sleeping giants and like you try to, you try to take it outside of the context of this band who has only gone up in accessibility at this point in time. Uh, so for people who listen to them, like we did, you're like, Oh, wow. This is like surprisingly just a straight up, barn burner like this just goes i could see this being played somewhere like mm -hmm. for instance i put it i put it on my halloween playlist for the party we had last year and like it fit right in but you know to the kids seeing this on you know maybe this played on mtv i don't know it had a music video it had to play fucking somewhere in 2004 to whoever found it there i have to imagine the reaction was just like not even like just not even like being off put at how much it is or like how heavy it is like you would have if it played a single from calculating infinity on the radio or something uh but just like what the f what what the fuck like i'm not sure i understand this but like why is this chorus catchier than most top 40 hits ever? <laughs> like, it's, it is my favorite song on this album. Uh, one thing that's kind of already been mentioned is that like with a lot of these more accessible moments with this record, the band made the decision to kind of bury them like for the most part. This is, and I think that's purposeful because um, not only does it kind of like sort of betray and uproot expectations if you've just heard the singles, but it also allows people who are more familiar with their earlier material, if you can imagine like this coming out and in 2004, to like be not so taken aback when you put the record on. Like it opens with, two tracks which are again like as as heavy as this band can possibly get with these first two tracks like panasonic youth is i think you get a sense of the more sort of charismatic and irreverent edge if you like go straight from um calculating infinity to this but you still have a, a sense of intensity that i think matches that record and pucciato's presence and scowling vocal delivery gives you something a little bit more to grip onto almost feels like it's dueling and even toying with the guitars at points playing off the musicality in, in a way that's different to minikakis who kind of just like barrages forward almost in complete you know, uh, rebellion with everything else around him and they try to match him. But um, Pucciato is kind of more playful. Uh, and then the album barrels into what's my favorite song on the record, which is Sunshine the Werewolf. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, without yeah. a moment of hesitation, it's just straight into this fucking song. 
Uh, it's not until over a minute into this song that you get the first like breather of the entire album where the midsection mm-hmm. sort of pairs back the noise and lets you take in how dynamic and dizzy and Chris Penny's drums are. Like I want to emphasize he's only on the first two studio records, I believe, of this band. And on both of them, he it just establishes himself as one of the best working drummers in metal. He, and I like that the band, like, because obviously he's fantastic when the band are like fully throttling and you get those really sort of intense percussive stuff. But I love the moments in Dillinger songs where the, the music kind of pairs back a little bit to let you appreciate how sophisticated the drumming actually is, let you kind of lock into it and focus on it. Um, and I also love in the song, the way that following this the band kind of lock into this super doomy riff section as Pucciato is screaming about how love kills uh you have these almost funny sort of midi sounding strings that kind of pop in very briefly as well give the whole thing a sort of surreal feeling uh and then you get like the fucking finale like the song when you have like just screaming lyrics like without my existence you are nothing and we fought like a nuclear war like jesus christ it that's is the invented where, hard that, that, yeah that's the moment where you can't <laughs> like there should be no doubt in your mind that pucciato is the right man to take the band forward from here then that moment when that hits you're like jesus christ i'm so on board yeah, the, le- the legibility of instruments here, I think, is maybe the biggest, like, shift, I think, just because Calculating Infinity is so focused on being this, like, naughty, wiry, impenetrable thing, whereas this, you know, again, by most musical listening standards, this is heavy as a motherfucker, and it is unfriendly if you are not familiar with extreme music. However, for the three of us, like, I know this is going to sound kind of stupid when I say it, but, like, you get to a certain point where you've heard enough music is that the Dillinger escape plan basically become, like, th- this is their pop era. This is when they're able to focus on more traditionally, again, legible ideas that are just more like, you know, for your average human being who, you know, listens to the top 40 or whatever, this is going to sound like hell noise. But to somebody who listens to a bunch of shit like this all the time, I listen to this and I'm like, wow, this is really catchy. Um, uh, yeah, cool. I mean, the fucking hook on something like uh, uh, Unretrified, which I mean, that so many parts of those uh, lines just stick with me. The fucking, this wasted in the end. is like, it's so, the melodies there are so, so tight and so, so good. And while I would say that, Pucciato definitely brings some of that irreverence that we've been alluding to is that the re one of the reasons that I love him so much too is that it's never really eclipsed by that is that really if anything Pucciato is almost like Mike Patton's tethered in that he has the same kind of animated delivery and range that he has but I never think that what he's saying is even remotely insincere like all of it's incredibly emotional. It's really like, you know, it can be lyrics like we fucked like a nuclear war, like, you know, shit like that. But it's like, that's just the intensity of the emotion of that moment. You have unretrified. And the cool thing about that is not the instrumental legibility, which is nice, but the emotional legibility of it. Um, We talked about like how a lot of like lyrics in this are just, you know, that pure concentrated id, uh, which is still true from this going forward. Like, It's fair to say that this band and Deftones, later speaking, they do actually have a lot of sonic similarities, but in terms of ethos and writing, they're largely about the same things. I'd say that not only is uh, Miss Machine largely about toxic romantic relationships, I'd say that pretty much every album going forward is more or less about that, even though albums like Option Paralysis have other things going on in them. But when you listen to something like Dissociation, when you listen to something like Ironworks, when you listen to something like One of Us is the Killer, especially that one, it's very much wrapped in these very, very distinct emotional codes that make it a bit easier to to latch onto and to understand. And that just sort of all goes into the like, this is like, if Calculating Infinity didn't exist, I would handily call Miss Machine the ugliest Dillinger Escape Plan album, because this is still separated from the first record. This is a nasty record. Like even the recording sounds 
almost intentionally like rougher than the things that have come before it because it adds a kind of instrumental edge to everything but they don't downplay the atmospherics they don't downplay anything so that it sounds like sludgier or it kind of gets gray or gets lost in the sort of uh the minutia of itself but oh man this is just full throttle from start to finish and unlike the things that have come before it it feels holistic in a way that this band hasn't really felt yet that they'll kind of carry on forward uh this is again like there's no right place to start with dillinger but if i had to say you know if you don't want to go with the mike Patton ep this is also another good place to start really is that it makes you appreciate the vast majority of their career in one album because this is in many ways the most important dillinger escape album to the canon of themselves because this is like the the, the, this is the My Arms, Your Hearse of the Dillinger discography. And the, this is the simultaneous arrival of this band and also the blueprint of everything that would come after. But it's not like diminished. I, this is in the upper half of my ranking just because I, I, I just love the songs so much. Uh, in fact, I would give this album a perfect score if not for the... I'm not sure why Crutchfield Tongs is on this album. I don't dislike it, but at the same time, it would undoubtedly be better and more flowing without it. Uh, it it's literally the only problem I have with it. Uh, I, everything that you all have spoken to is 100% true. I mean, Greg arrives with like as fully formed as possible. It's like he's always been a part of the band, frankly. Um, and if you didn't listen to Irony is a Dead Scene, I just can't imagine going from calculating infinity to this. Like I had that missing link because I went in order. But if you just go from studio album to studio album, it's just like you can see similarities, but the appeal is like, you know, it's just one end of the spectrum and the other end of the spectrum. I think uh, that's it's reflected in the fact that when this came out, like it was quite polarizing to fans of this mm -hmm. band. Like you were either on board for this new shift or you jumped off the train entirely. And now ironically, it shares the easily second highest rating on rate your music as uh, for the band tied with calculating infinity. So I feel like people have really with time come around. And also I think that kind of speaks to Dillinger as a band as a whole is that like, I feel like, you know, they were successful in everything and like a bunch of people, you know, like they, they were as popular as a band like that could be. But at the same time, I feel like albums like this and the direction that they took here is best appreciated in retrospect. And when you have the total amount of hindsight and context that you do is that you can only really appreciate Dillinger for, for what they did and the boundaries they've pushed now that you know all the other kinds of music that were happening even in the same scene at the same time. Uh, it, it's really like, it's really genuinely groundbreaking uh, the way they fit all of these pieces together. And again, th this could be unretrified is totally something that could play on a radio station very much. Like I, I get that, I can see that. And that's probably why they were able to maintain the momentum of whatever the hell they're deciding to do on here. Uh, the I, I think what really sticks it for me is, again, the emotional legibility of everything. Uh, that's maybe my favorite part about Dillinger Escape Plan, broadly speaking, is that, you know, with like, I compare them to Deftones in terms of like the subject material that they write about, is that with Deftones, you kind of get lost in the sound more than you get lost in the content of the lyrics at first. And as a result, the slightly abstract nature of some of Deftones songs feel a bit elusive. Uh, it's why those albums are such growers in the long run is that they sort of take on a meaning to you that you have to discover. Whereas here, I feel like everything has a little tiny bit more definition so that you can just sort of understand that like, you know, it's not exactly better or worse than whatever Deftones did, but it's more of a like, I, I feel this sort of raw primal aggression that feels very honest and as a result of, of something. Uh, and it, it starts an arc for the band too, is that with every iteration of these ideas, it's presented in kind of a new concept. This is just sort of the base form of their thematic core. For all of the talk that we've had about <laughs> Dillinger being in their pop era, typically we associate that that kind of phrasing with being a bit less unique and being a little bit more replicable 
Um, yes. And I think this is when Dillinger escape plan becomes truly irreplicable as yes. a unit. Because at this point, I mean, the, the closest point of comparison for a lot of this album is the self-titled Mr. Bungle album. But Mr. Bungle were never interested in being this concise or even this catchy. Um, it main, this Miss Machine maintains that sort of outlandishness and sort of crude <laughs> countercultural bent while also playing up the hardcore influences of it. Everything on here has one, at least one moment that is like transcendent. Uh, like I think mm-hmm. of a deeper cut, like Phone Home, where uh, like, where he's like, you belong to me. And I'm like, like, and yeah, more traditionally appealing passage of music than anything on Calculating Infinity. And to me, it's because of that legibility that it is all the more bone chilling. <laughs> Is like, it just yes. me or does like he uh, sound a little bit like Downward Spiral era Trent Reznor on that song oh, specifically? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I was Not very, entirely yeah. dissimilar attitudes, Frank. Uh, hell, there are moments on here where I'm reminded of not just Mike Patton but or Trent Reznor, but also fucking uh, uh, Devin Townsend of all people, who I honestly think this band shares a lot of spiritual kinship with, uh, mm-hmm. both thematically and sound-wise, because like... You know, I, I'm not going to say that Dillinger are a progressive metal band, but they're also not not a progressive metal band, like especially later. But they that sort of element that makes them quintessential, like it, that's that's the thesis statement for Dillinger as a whole is what Morgan said, is that like it, it like making their sound more accessible, it, like most of the time, most artists and most bands making their sound accessible makes them it dilutes them a bit. Whereas this just made Dillinger more unique. This mm-hmm. just made them unique amongst their peers even, but amongst the world of music as a whole. It's like, I mean, th- this for all intents and purposes to me is the Dillinger escape plans Jane Doe. Mm-hmm. Well, what's interesting is um, firstly on the note of the Devin Townsend thing, uh, bassist Liam Wilson, who I forgot to mention has joined the band at this point and would remain their bass player for the rest of the band's discography he has also played bass for Devin Townsend uh, and his band as well. Another kind of crucial aspect of Pucciato's addition to the band and something that starts to show a presence here becomes more pronounced on later records. And I think is a really important part of defining this band's identity from this point forward is his thematic and lyrical interests, which we've kind of already alluded to in terms of like, you know, these albums that are in large part about these kind of devastating interpersonal relationships and how they kind of fall apart, how people mistreat each other, how people abuse each other, like the violence of sex and how it can be used and misused. And this kind of really, because that's kind of, so those sorts of ideas and fragmented forms are presented on Calculating Infinity because Minicarchus talks about those sorts of things in very sort of abstract and just violent ways. But I think Pucciato finds a voice that is, well, he he's writes more conventionally for starters. He writes more in line with the sort of lyricism you're familiar with from like rock bands more so than metal bands yeah. in, in a lot of senses. And on a song like Sunshine the Werewolf, which is the one I want to highlight lyrically, uh, this is a song that Greg has talked about being inspired specifically by uh, people who deliberately uh, give and receive HIV so that they can romantically share a fatal disease and like die together of the same thing like it's this really bizarre um, sexual deviance that is kind of tragic and and Pucciato like kind of sings from the perspective of this character who is uh, taken into a relationship by someone who claims to be to want to do this but then eventually kind of leaves them and and embraces someone else and this is kind of betrayal by someone who has led you into this relationship promising to die with you and then kind of gives you a fatal disease and abandons you and so that is a very specific subject matter that the kind of core of what that story is about a betrayal that is kind of like a life or a death sort of betrayal is like the kind has the kind of intensity has the kind of like uh sort of tragic 
tone to it that I think would define a lot of the melodrama of Pucciato's writing going forward. Like he 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 has e equal parts kind of like these sort of sweeping dramatic stories of a tragic betrayal and a love and these kind of blunt, brutally direct lyrics of, that are just like, you know, you fucking deserve to die or whatever. Like he 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 kind of goes between these two different modes. And I think Sunshine the Werewolf is kind of like the blueprint for all of that. And there's other songs on this record too that kind of have similarly similar sorts of subject matter as well. Um, but that was the one that really leapt out to me. And we can kind of talk a bit more about uh, the songwriting, I guess, as we go on. But that was I, that I think kind of gives you a signpost as to the interests of this band um, going forward. And um, the other thing I was going to bring up is with relation to what separates Dillinger Escape Land from other kind of metalcore or math rock bands, what makes them kind of unique and what makes them so lasting is, um, like we talked about the, the moments of kind of commercial friendly-esque, you know, metal music that appear on parts of this record and parts of basically almost every Dillinger record going forward. And it's a big part of what distinguishes them. Obviously, it's probably a big part of what turned Puris off of them when they kind of embraced Pucciato and he brought this forward. But the thing is like, and it's it's really, Pucciato is kind of integral to this. He has this charisma. He has this character. And more importantly, he has this incredible singing voice that he's able to use. And he's able to give as much power and weight as his screaming voice. And when you think about other metalcore bands, you think about other math rock bands, that's something that they often by and large don't have. Even a lot of the biggest and most mm -hmm. technically talented and most uh, critically successful bands in this mode don't necessarily have someone who can do these two different iterations and sides of the vocal performance with as much equal power as Pucciato is able to muster. I think that's where Morgan, your Mr. Bungle comparison is sort of being the most uh, comparable band to this one is really, really apropos. I mean, this band have talked at a great length about their influence from Faith No More and Mr. Bungle, obviously, beyond simply just having Patton on for an EP. Like, that's a huge part of the identity of this band. And so it is kind of like carrying the mantle forward from bands like Faith No More, from bands like Mr. Bungle, who kind of, you know, just sort of dissolved more or less beyond the 90s, or at least became irrelevant beyond the 90s. And taking that forward with this new, unique style of extreme technical musicianship, and that's what's super, super great about Miss Machine is that it really lays the groundwork for all of that. It lays all of it out. It, it's, it's, I think that is a big part of why it's endured so much is that no matter what aspects of Dillinger you love the most, you get everything here and you get mm -hmm. everything here seasoned so beautifully and so powerfully. Um, it, it's, yeah, it, it's an absolute fucking triumph of a record. Cry our eyes, Following the release of Miss Machine, the band toured this record relentlessly. They, I believe, supported bands like Slipknot, System of a Down, and Megadeth uh, in the wake of this album. However, the tours for this record were replete with injuries and kind of tumultuous events. Um, multiple members of the band were injured in one way or another. Um, they were forced to drop out of Dave Mustaine's Gigant tour in 2005 um, due to multiple injuries that Ben Wyman sustained. And so it was kind of a bit of a tumultuous time for the band. And there was a sense that there was, I think, a bit of a, not a huge gap between this record and the next one, but you feel like with their next record, they're almost kind of reseating the table again. Uh, despite having just done that on Miss Machine. Also worth noting that Chris Penny left the band during the time in which their next record was being written and prepared, which was a kind of a big fucking deal, considering that Penny was kind of integral to the core of what this band was. He identified a couple of things that were uh, in, that influenced his decision to leave the band in an interview in 2017, where he apparently referred to the band declining a touring slot with a quote, really big band that remained nameless, uh, without actually clearing it with the other members. So there were points at which Penny felt sort of left out of um, key discussions in terms of the future of the band, and also 
Penny just, I think, developed interests outside of being in the band. He became interested in composing and became kind of felt a little bit limited by some of the contractual commitments of being in the band. Um, it's but also it worth noting that he drummed in Coheed and Cambria for two albums in between this time. Yes, I saw and that as well. Rele- relevant Which album? to uh, the Year of the Black Rainbow and No World for Tomorrow. Oh, shit. Okay. Indeed. Um, so, yeah, this sudden event happening like so much into the process for the next album really kind of threw them out of a loop uh ben wyman started to program drums uh in the meantime because they just couldn't find a new drummer and they at one point sean reinhardt was considered to be in the band as their new drummer which would have been fuck utterly amazing but eventually they but eventually they went with uh, the comparatively lesser known Gil Sharon, who helped them to finish the record and who essentially really picks up a lot of the slack in terms of um, ensuring that this record doesn't sound fractured in the wake of Penny's departure in terms of the rhythm section. And look, I'm just going to be blunt up front here. I fucking love this album. I think this is the strongest single release up until this point in the band's discography. I really wish I could have the super hot take and say I think it's their best album, but I mean, there's a certain record. We all know what it is. I can't pretend it's not like the, the, the thing that it is, but like this is like definitely my second favorite album in this discography. And there is a long journey toward it getting here because I used to be frustrated with it. Maybe it's also telling that this was the first studio album of this band that I heard after listening to Irony is a Dead Scene. Uh, And I was put onto it because I saw a Deep Cuts video where I think he recommended it and like mentioned the sort of IDM and electronic elements that are present on this record and that influence this record and now knowing that the band were without a drummer for the early part of the writing process you can kind of see how toying around with um, sequencers and with uh, electronic drum programming may have influenced the sound of this record but I said before that Ioworks is kind of like the band resetting the table after having reset the table on this machine and I will back that up by saying that while you this is clearly the work of the same band more or less like you have so much of the same intensity and so much of the same uh, ruthless character of an album like miss machine what you have is a seedier kind of sound palette you have and obviously the integration of the electronic elements you have a band that feel like they're reaching further and and still trying to redefine their identity even like almost well, not even almost like basically a decade into their existence as a band and what my relationship with this record over the years has been strange because like it is on its face the most kind of structurally incoherent Dillinger Escape Plan album certainly the first couple of times not even couple the first many times that I encountered it it absolutely defies the logic of traditional album structuring it cleaves itself into these three distinct parts that even still don't have a whole amount of like musical coherence within themselves it is an album that is lurching from one idea to the next with the same Uh, kind of speed that dillinger lurched from musical ideas within individual songs like on the whole on the macro level this album is frenetic it's crazy it's absolutely fucking unhinged in a way that the band haven't been since um calculating infinity but of course that doesn't resemble that record and sound it's just it's totally its own thing uh it opens with the one-two punch of fix your face and lurch both of which i think banger both of which condense what the band do best into harrowing two minutes a piece giving you plenty of the dillinger you're used to while ratcheting up the sense of fucking dread and this is where i get into one thing i love about this album which is how kind of dread inducing it sounds how kind of just eerie and uneasy and kind of just unsettling it is like this is a record that lingers in ambience and lingers in kind of darkness more so than any record prior to it it's an album that has this sense of sort of like keeping you unclear or unsure of where it's going more so than any other record and the end result of that is 
for me personally, one of the most hypnotic listening experiences this band has created from front to back with those two blast fucking door down openers you get some of what you're familiar with dillinger but it sounds like even tighter and even more wiry than it did on miss machine they're just two of the best and most concise and most gripping songs the band had made up until this point and then you get the utter surprise of black bubble gum which is interesting because like in the context of this, this discography it's not that surprising they made radio friendly more accessible songs on Miss Machine, but when you're listening to Ironworks and you just made it through Fix Your Face and Lurch, Lurch incidentally might be the most a f- fucking intense song they've made up until this point. But then you get Black Bubblegum, which is, in my opinion, the best of these kind of more commercial songs that the band would ever make. It is. Which they my, performed on Conan. They, they did. On, Thank you for bringing it, that up. Well, they, watching that is really funny <laughs> because it, you're just imagining it, what the audience it, is thinking yeah it's exactly right it's like this band's commercial peak in terms of like uh public awareness is coinciding with this their most like experimental album for lack of a better word and so like the black bubble that the fact that black bubble gum is on this and milk lizard as well to a certain extent is kind of funny when you consider all that surrounds them like they are the the bread that kind of sit on either side of the sandwich of the bizarro midsection of this record but yeah black bubble gum in my opinion is it's the single dillinger song i've listened to the most it just has my favorite fucking chorus that Pucciato's ever fucking written uh, it's just so fucking intense and um the the way that he ends on like it's what you wanted to feel and then just really strings that out is so like gratifying and satisfying it's it's just intense it's incredible even the pre-chorus is like bizarro and nutso and catchy as hell like everything about the song to me is everything I love about the Dillinger escape plan just distilled uh, so much and then you get the suite of just weird sort of avant-garde occasionally heavy electronic and occasionally warmly organic and occasionally just deeply discomforting and bizarre songs that stretch from track four to track eight and it's really interesting I think when I think encountering this record on streaming and encountering this record digitally which is obviously the best way to con- to consume a record that is this digital and aesthetic it can like be a bit of an affront to like whirl through these songs and just have them being like occurring in such quick succession and being such a so bizarre compared to what you're used to from this band but I think if you consume this record and take this stretch of music as a single suite which I think is how it plays when you just listen to the record it becomes a little bit more satisfying and it becomes a little bit less um untethered i think you have these really interesting uh musical ideas that the band pull off surprisingly well like the eerie dissonant ambience of sick on sunday which weirdly reminded me of shushu more than anything else you have the brutally overblown bass synth hits of the fractured and broken when acting as a wave which is one of my other favorite songs on this record you have the lacerating 82588 which matches the stranger moments since then uh, bringing the album full circle as it kind of launches into its final section which is the longest section a brilliant and dizzying section of some of the most creative and original material this band have ever laid down to date the eerie and serenading horns that wheeze through Milk Lizard are matched in bizarro presence by this jazzy avant piano part that dips as quickly as it arrives and switches from garbled, screamed vocals to an unexpectedly catchy and tuneful chorus from Pucciato. That's another almost funny demonstration of how close the band could weave to the kind of rock that was filling the radio waves in this exact time in the mid 2000s. In a lot of ways, with a song like Milk Lizard, it feels like the band are directly addressing that kind of music and showing the limitless possibilities of how texture and flavor and instrumental variation can elevate that kind of bog standard like stock radio rock music, right? The piano part that comes in during the finale of the song, which is a lot calmer than the sort of avant piano part that comes in earlier, gives a real sense of kind of like portent 
and dread to Greg's screams that this feels like never ending. I love the way that those screams kind of get gradually more intense and less tuneful the more that he screams it. Like it's like you get a display of his range all the way from the most sort of tuneful to the most sort of like unfriendly. But anyway, I don't want to steal the spotlight on every track here, but um, yeah, I, I really, really love this album. I have more to say about the songs I haven't mentioned, um, but I want to hear from you guys at this point, because this is one of the more divisive records in this catalog. What's your relationship been with this particular album and how do you feel when you listen to it relative to the records preceding it up to this point? So I, I will start by saying that this is my least favorite Dillinger project. And there is a very express reason for that, that has almost nothing to do with the very strange sort of unwieldy middle section. In this lineup, as we've discussed, the drummer Chris Penny uh, was an absolutely integral part of what Dillinger was up until this point. And his absence is very creatively made up for um, and I think that's what gives this album a lot of its singular charm, especially within this discography. I think Gil Sharon does an admirable job on the kit, uh, stepping into someone like Chris Penny's place. But it's hard to not feel like something is kind of missing here. On the other hand, I think that's, as I said, what gives this record a lot of its singular appeal is that we're sort of forced to wander even farther out of their comfort zone, particularly in the, the stretch of tracks four through eight, had to push themselves in increasingly interesting and creative directions that were new for the band and were never really revisited in the aftermath of this album. At the risk of beating a bit of a dead horse here, I got to say my thoughts really aren't that divorced from Morgan's. When I first listened to all the Dillinger albums, this was a standout of being the effort that I deemed the, the weakest that I connected with the least. And while I've definitely grown to appreciate it a hell of a lot more, I still really can't say that that's changed. I'm kind of right there with Morgan and that like, if I was putting together my favorite albums list, which I have, Every Dillinger Escape Plan album makes that really, really long list, except for this one. And again, you've all pointed out, I'm not exactly somebody who is like a diehard for album structure, you know? Like, if something's a little wonky, if it's good enough, I'll kind of look past that. Thing is, is that the middle section here it bothers me, not because it's experimental, but because I deem it kind of insufficient the real problem for me with the midsection isn't that it's experimental or weird it's that it's composed solely of asterisk interesting half measures every song here is a minute and change everything is less than two minutes and it feels like just as soon as these songs gain momentum just as soon as they find themselves they're over and then they go to another song and that song feels interesting and then is a different type of interesting and it just keeps going and going and going. And I get that, that might be the appeal for some people, probably the appeal for Riley. And in theory, I get it. But in practice, I'm just like, I want more of this experimental shit. I want more of this because what you're doing is cool. It's just that it's the second I'm on board with it, we're done. And these songs not only have like, they're not only like weirder, exploring more like different vocal tonalities, different processing of the vocals themselves and weird, interesting um, production choices that sound like, you know, all of the weirder parts on albums as far back as Calculating Infinity. And that stuff is cool. And it also lasts barely long enough for me to register that it's really happening. And I'm just kind of sitting there like if you doubled the length of this shit and just and hell, maybe put in more ideas, I feel like I can respect it more. But as it stands, Ironworks feels like a lot of concessions to be made is that I think this album is great, but it forces me to hone down on the reasons why I don't love it as much as the other ones. And a lot of it, too, has to do with the fact that the albums that follow this are 
I deem to be incomparable. I deem to be the basically the 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 strongest efforts that the band is has put out for the most part. And a lot of it too is the fact that the weird, wiry, fucked up identity that this album has is kind of embodied later on other albums that I like a considerable amount more. Like they they just sort of know how to capture the the singularity and the weirdness and the the darkness that's here. I also will espouse probably my most unpopular Dillinger Escape Plan opinion in that, okay, look, I don't dislike any Dillinger Escape Plan song, not even close. That said, Black Bubblegum, not my favorite Dillinger song. I don't know what it is. Like everybody creams their pants over this song. Everybody says this is like one of the best ones, best on the album. I listen to it and I'm like, it's cool. That's about all I have to say about it. It's like, it doesn't, it just doesn't really do much for me. It's like, yeah, it's cool. It's one of the popular Dillinger songs. I like, I would never in a billion years pick it over something like unretrified. Uh, th- it just, it does not have the impact that, that song has and it does not have the catchiness either. But again, Milk Lizard, Party Smasher, Dead is History, best song on the album for me. Unbelievable. Also just fucking weird in a way that I wish every song on here was and not to mention Horse Hunter and Mouth of Ghosts again this is a stellar one-two punch ending for another Dillinger album uh I mean like I would say it's one of the best but like these motherfuckers can end records uh but then again Horse Hunter is sort of like it it just kind of grounds you for the absolute fucking wildness that comes with Mouth of Ghosts which is really really awesome uh it's just frustrating it's because like i've never wanted to like an album more than ireworks it's just that when i keep listening to it i'm like the kind of throw everything at the wall approach is just something that i feel works better on other records i can understand it and hey you're certainly not the first person to feel that way but i think i can articulate why i like it a bit better now having kind of thought about it for a little bit is that you know, we the term transitional album gets bandied out a lot. And a lot of the time it's used disparagingly to kind of talk down a record that is surrounded on either side by records that people prefer vastly more. Um, so I think it can lose sight of the fact that in here that an album being transitional is not inherently a bad thing, nor does it inherently take away from how great a record can be. And I also think it's kind of a limiting term all the same, though, because what this record does and kind of representing Dillinger Escape Plan's continued evolution during this point, and the structure I think is key to this, is that the three sections that this album is kind of cleaved into represent, I think, the past, the present, and the future of this band in terms of increasing musical sophistication, not just in terms of arrangements, which have always been sophisticated, but like in terms of increasing the presence of instrumentation that goes beyond traditional conventional metalcore and like giving more space to the uh, more spacious and atmospheric sections of their songs, more diversity, more clarity. To me, this record is kind of like a whirlwind of the creative process of Dillinger Escape Plan that you get to witness in real time. You get those first three songs, which are in turns like incredibly heavy and incredibly muscular, very familiar from the first two records. And you get that slice of pop with black bubble gum that you've gotten accustomed to from Miss Machine. And then you get this midsection of the record, which is essentially the band taking the creative place of stagnation they're in with the departure of their drummer and with the kind of I think again the for me at least I know narrative doesn't necessarily like factor in as much for everyone but like for me the difficulty and the turmoil the band went through in terms of like all the suffering and injury and and touring woes and drama in the wake of Miss Machine all of that stuff gets transfused into the present section of the record the midsection of the record which to me is like a maelstrom of avant-garde sound that forms a representation of the creative frustration of the place that Dillinger are in you have fragments of familiar sort of math core like you have moments in this midsection where it gets really genuinely heavy and you get moments where it feels like that just glitches away and like falls apart and the 
band are not able to kind of make that stay. And there's a real sense of drama to the way that this midsection progresses, to me anyway. There's a real sense of like a band literally being torn apart by the departure of a founding member and literally trying to creatively represent the feeling of being torn apart as a band through music. And I, and again, like the narrative sweep of this album to me, like with the past in the first section, the present in the midsection of this like utter turmoil that they're experiencing. To me, like the glitchy electronics and the weird sort of avant-garde atmospherics are like musical representations of the injuries that the band has suffered on tour. Like the mental strain that the band has been placed under, the psychological strain of like still trying to find an identity and a fan base and maintain that in the wake of all of these shifts that have been happening with every release they've put out and every tour that they've done. All of that to me gets the energy of that anyway, gets put into this midsection of the record. And that's why I love it. And then you get the final section of the record, which I I think we'd probably all agree, best section of all, like the final section oh, yeah. of this record is the future of Dillinger Escape Plan. Not in the sense that every album would sound like this section necessarily, but that it showcases this band's growing idea of what's possible. I mean, the more ornate instrumentation, particularly the piano that shows up and some of the strings and ambience and stuff, they would become more pronounced on the next record and then would come to kind of define their sort of magnum opus closing period as well but they are done so beautifully and so gorgeously here. I've already talked about how Milk Lizard brings you back from that avant-garde section with some familiar stuff that's still like messier and wilder and wirier. But then you have uh, songs like Party Smasher, which is just absolutely unhinged. You have Dita's History, which Jacob already mentioned beautifully. I absolutely agree. This is a standout on the record. It integrates those electronic elements more fully. So I think yeah, that midsection purposefully off kilter, purposefully kind of broken. And that's absolutely fair if that doesn't work for you. But in the context of the record, the way that you get a song like Dita's History, which integrates those elements much more naturally and fully, feels like the band are kind of finding themselves again in real time. And you get these little details and flourishes that saturate and tear at the fabric of this song. At points, it sounds like this song has a viral infection that's kind of eating away at it. Even Greg's vocals on Data's History are processed to sound like they're being fed through machinery at certain points. This, to me, is the closest that the band gets to industrial metal, which is so unbelievably my shit that I don't even need to tell you guys. You get it. You know what I'm like. But the industrial metal vibes, parts of this record, particularly parts of this song, are just like... just food for me they're yummy i love that shit you have even what sounds like a theremin that pops up in the midsection of the song to keep the melody while the percussion and the electronics are embellishing it i haven't actually checked if that's a theremin but I, it sounds an awful lot like a theremin it might be midi it might be done electronically but um or like on a on a laptop i mean obviously it's an electronic instrument but um yeah that shit was awesome uh and then you have like the ending of the song is particularly ethereal and kind of shocking every time I hear it. The band, I think for the first time ever, approach like pure plaintive beauty in a way that feels like touching. Like it's kind of forlorn in the way that it sounds, but it's so beautiful, especially as you have those electronic squelches kind of fading away to leave you in this gorgeous place. And then like, of course, because this is Dillinger Escape Plan, Horse Hunter just fucking breaks the door down straight away and stabs you in the fucking face. You have Brent Hines of Mastodon on this song, assisting Pucciato doing the vocals and like, I think the second verse. I think when, when he turns up, you can he, he kind of fits in so well. I didn't notice him the first few times I heard this record. And obviously I, I, I just thought that was Greg being weird. I mean, no, it's, it's Brent Hines, man. Yeah, um, and of course- it sounds like Horse Hunter sounds like the name of a Mastodon song. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah. 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 Almost shit. dangerously close. <laughs> yeah. So. And he's also like doing one of the record's best hooks as well. I think this track is underrated in terms of like how catchy and cool it is, especially towards the end when it gets really cookie, cookie, hooky. <laughs> 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 cookie. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, give me a cookie. Uh, <laughs> once again, the end Put of this... Put a cookie down. <laughs> the end of this song feels like a weird fusion of like industrial metal and like some like 80s heavy metal shit, like maybe Iron Maiden-esque in some of the guitar playing, but filtered through the palette of sounds on this record. And I can't put into words to you how it feels to hear like a guitar sound and a song sound that's clearly influenced by 80s heavy metal being played through the synthetic production. By the way, I actually can't believe that we've um, forgotten to, or not forgotten to, but we've neglected to um, talk about a very key figure in this band, uh, which is producer Steve Everts, who is behind the boards on every album they made, I think, I think except for, I'm not sure how much of dissociation he was involved in, but he's behind the boards for basically everything they've done. He's a legendary metal producer. And his ability to sort of be malleable as a producer and to adjust the production style to what the band is doing on any given record whether it is the fulsome sound of something like calculating infinity or whether it's the really kind of scratchy sound of something like uh, option paralysis or whether it's the fully throated heft of one of us is the killer like he is just a god at this and he's super important he's basically the nigel godrich of this band if we were to make a comparison and I value what he does most of all on this record because this is the hardest record to produce well in terms of what the band are trying to do. And then you have Mouth of Ghosts, which is my favorite Dillinger Escape Plan song. Um, it is utterly phenomenal. I, I cannot describe to you the emotions that I experience when I listen to this. Not only is it my favorite Dillinger Escape Plan song, it's one of my favorite closing tracks on any album ever. Like, it's, I, I, <sighs> deep breath. This shit is like beautiful, man. <laughs> like, it's beautiful and it's weird and it's devastating. That beautiful piano that turned up in some of the earlier tracks, like, um, oh, I forget which one, but the beautiful piano is back. It's backed by some of Gil Sharon's best work on this record. I know, Morgan, you definitely gave him his props, even if the band is kind of lost between your two main drummers. But he, on this song in particular, is doing some really jazzy stuff that I love, some really tasteful fills and flourishes. I think this band demonstrate a kind of dynamic ability to build in a non-heavy way. Uh, quite beautifully and they had never really displayed this so well before this point the way the song progresses is truly I think the work of seasoned professionals that are uncovering and releasing new potential new creative flair and it's so affirming that it's hard to doubt them as one of the most original and unlimited in potential metal bands of their time by the time you get to the fucking amazing finale of the song where Greg is howling, you were a mouth without a heart and an action without meaning, and you walk afraid, reaching for the hands that turned closed, which is my favorite lyric he's ever written. Uh, when, and the way he lands it too, the way he repeats it and the way he lands it is like, there's not a possibly, is not a, a, a I, I can't fathom a better way to end an album than that. It is maybe the most impactful moment of the entire discography for me is the very like last way he delivers that line and the song just fucking just, just reaches its peak. Like that to me, that, yeah, this, that, ah. <laughs> I'm actually in some ways kind of glad that um, and this is your two least favorite Dillinger records because it gives my like hot take a little bit more kind of weight, I guess. I don't know. And that also means like this gets to be like my Dillinger record, um, which is awesome. Like it's it's fun when you have like a record and, and your discography and a band's discography that like all of your friends associate with you. And and I would think that even before I went on the sixteen to tirade, Ironworks would kind of be that album. But yeah, Can just confirms just just to affirm that this shit rules. I love how fucking conceptual it is in terms of like album construction, and I just yeah. It's the one for me. To continue the journey, 
It's worth noting that Gil Sharon left the band in 2009, was replaced by Billy Reimer, who Morgan has alluded to as his favorite drummer in this band. I mean, it's really difficult to even make a case against that, especially because what Reimer does on these next three records is so varied in terms of like skill and ability that, look, there's no point pitting these drummers against each other. They're all, yeah. they're all my favorite, but Reimer is a particularly special addition, I think. Also quite important is, in terms of the narrative of the band, is that in May of 2009, they announced that they were going to leave their label, Relapse Records, and particularly were incredibly disillusioned with the world of music promotion, the music industry, the music media world, and they created their own independent record label, which they actually didn't like to refer to as a record label, because again, they wanted to distance themselves from the, I guess, the, the, the machine of industry, but they called it Party Smasher Incorporated, and they used it to self-release their fourth studio album, which is Option Paralysis. And so one of the things that the three of us have kind of like mused on in our own time is like why this album seems to be the least heard, maybe, I don't know, maybe Dissociation is the least heard, but certainly the least sort of hyped Dillinger Escape Plan album like it's the one that's lowest rated on radio music which I know is not an indicator for overall reception across the world but it's pretty good doesn't make it any less stupid that it's the lowest it is a bit strange and I think maybe part of that is the reason that in leaving their label and sort of releasing this independently they had kind of less sort of support less sort of backing and it's a more maybe I don't know how to describe this well but it's kind of a more confronting and just sort of like in your face album than anything that they'd made in this particular decade. But that is, I think, countered or at least like complemented by the fact that this is the most concise and tight album they had made up until this point, just 10 tracks and no like weird sort of diversions, no like weird sort of little things, like just 10 great songs from front to back and no filler whatsoever. And it is also worth noting as well is that this album, which I should note, came out in 2010, in March of 2010, is maybe the most sort of conceptually dense album that the band ever made in terms of like what Pucciato was trying to, what Pucciato and the band's interests were in this particular period. And so I think this is maybe more important to talk about than any other record in this discography. And why I think it's relevant to bring up the band's label troubles and industry, industry troubles is that in large part, this is a record about feeling disaffected and alienated from a large amount of so like music and popular media and, and just in general, like popular culture, feeling as though the landscape is saturated, feeling as though the people are fake and, and not particularly real, feeling as though like no one really fully appreciates what artistry is, and to a certain extent, and I haven't seen this case made, but I could understand if someone felt that this is maybe the most preachy Dillinger Escape Plan record, maybe the record where they're most kind of like, uh, where, where Greg is maybe a little bit insufferable on a pure lyrical level at certain points like this is second song good neighbor is a song about greg, greg being really really mad that some that kids can download his music for free on like napster or whatever like it's his lars ulrich moment um and so like topically the record is more sort of is less subtle and more kind of like in your face about a lot of what it's about and i think it gets away with that because of how it matches that lack of subtlety with the super intense, super concise, just full on barrage of sound that the record represents. And also how it takes some of those elements that we heard in the last third of IO works that signaled a band progressing beyond their basic musical template and incorporating them into songs like Widower, for example. Um, but I want to step back at this point. I talked heaps on the last record, so I'm happy to let you guys really dominate this one. What is it about option paralysis that really stands out to you guys? And what do you guys make of the way this record sounds, the way this record sits in the discography and the concept behind it? This to me is, it would be silly, 
to describe any Dillinger escape plan record as hopeful in any sense, but I think option paralysis is the most hopeless and bleak. What comes to mind for me is the sort of midsection of the opening track, Farewell Mona Lisa, where Greg Clean sings for the first time on the record, uh, there's no feeling in this place. The echoes of the past speak louder than any voice I hear right now. Don't you ever try to be more than you were destined for or anything worth fighting for. Which, like, the... the let me talk about this song as in, in general for a second. This song... This is the best thing the band had done up to this point. Top take. three tracks for me in the discography in general. If we were to just talk it, briefly about ratings on this, uh, even though this is the lowest rated Dillinger album on Rate Your Music, Feel Well Mona Lisa is the highest rated song on any of their albums. It has a 4.54, I think. That's That makes me very happy. Correct. For me, it's the most emotionally evocative thing they had ever done and it's all nuanced emotions as well because you have the calculating infinity miss machine sort of controlled lunacy for the first portion of the track and then you get to that midsection and you're like fucking hell this is what rock bottom sounds like then it takes that sound and then it fucking just ramps it right up and does the same thing but louder in every sense and it's so resonant in so many ways and this is hardly the only moment on this record like that i hate the fact that this is only my third favorite dillinger escape plan record because it doesn't make any fucking sense what is this band uh, that's my fourth like i don't even fuck man what who 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 allowed you to do this to me? It's just... <laughs> Fuck. You fucking widower. Like... <sighs> it's like, oh, we're gonna fully embrace the Nine Inch Nails influence yeah. on this band. But we're gonna do it on widower. We're gonna take from still instead of you know the downward spiral or something and i like i i fucking that makes me want to break shit is is whatever the saddest song this band's ever recorded i am i'm not sure no but close is my answer to that widower is my third favorite dillinger escape song by the by and i would argue that my number two and one are sadder. <laughs> yeah i wasn't s- certain of that at all when i said it but um just put that feeling out there but you're yeah y- you are not at all outside the realm of like if someone said that i would be like yeah i mean per- sure yeah why yeah. not yeah but, but then i think about the last lyrics on any dillinger escape plan album and i'm like mother fuck I, this is a feeling that even in its most blisteringly Dillinger-esque intense moments on a- option paralysis pervades the entire thing. It's a sense of loss in every way. I think the title of the album really is emblematic of this in its own sort of indirect way where it reflects the the moments in our lives where we are at a crossroads and because of inaction things happen to us or for us or on our behalf and we feel that we have lost both options in the process or any option really when grief is directly being literally invoked on something like widower there's also a sense of metaphorical grief of the sort of disenfranchisement that the band felt at this point in time. And it pervades everything on the record. I also want to point out the closer parasitic twins, uh, Mm. one of my absolute favorite Dillinger songs. That's not even still nine inch nails at that point. That's like, 
that hesitation marks before hesitation <laughs> marks. That yeah. to me is like one of the most like bewildering songs this band ever released in terms of like still finding new ways to make you go like they can they can do this they can like what are they this is it's one of the most original songs he say in their this? in their discography to me i mean literally like why how at one point someone didn't burst into the studio and say you this is this is stop it I you're mean, gonna kill yourself if like, you were to tell me <laughs> If you were to tell me before I listened to this that this album was going to have Beach Boys S harmonies on the closing track, Love like I I California. would have to, I would break. <laughs> I want to add to what you're saying about the opening track of this record, Farewell Mona Lisa, because I feel like I can't really be impressed enough, like how like definitive this song is, like for this band, like there's a, a, there's a real case for this as like the 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 best song they ever made and it again it outlines the concept of this record really well like uh Pucciato refers to it as like the cultural depression of the era and again like he's very much kind of like a little bit old man yells at cloud but he's also kind of like making a good point as well like and and a, a point that's quite potent and persuasive and again like it that the reason it doesn't come across as kind of preachy is the fact that it's so emotional which is so, so key to how this that way that the song works. Like Pucciato conveys his feelings of being sort of tired and weary at a world that is stagnating and afraid of change, where all of like the, like essentially what he's doing is like saying, oh, we need to take it back to the good old days. But he's able to take that sentiment of good old days and make it feel like genuinely kind of paralyzing and affecting and not two-dimensional like it is in the hands of lesser writers um and and i think the lyrics that you quoted morgan are like emblematic of that i really show that in a powerful way and the way that he kind of just goes like what did you expect that we would never leave home like that that shit is it's it's both like hard hitting it's hard hitting in every sense that uh, a vocal delivery and lyric can be hard hitting emotionally physically it's it's tough it's really tough and the fact that there are other moments on this record that match it emotionally are it is incredible to me like it, it is incredible even for this band up until this point like if i god damn it gold teeth on a bum like uh. this fucking song is unbelievably good like again it's a song that on the face of it is about the shallowness of the world around greg as he perceives it the sense in which people's in his words like priorities are fucked up and i see again this is a super tight record and one of the best aspects of it is that it doesn't obviously it doesn't have any filler being super tight but also the deep cuts are really fucking good and almost match that iconic songs on this album room full of eyes is one of my favorites here for just how purely unhinged and deranged it is even for this era of the band it also has this incredibly cool like half speed breakdown about two and a half minutes into it that sounds like doomy and like titanic and larger than life the bass in this track is super chunky and lurching shout out liam wilson this is a song that sounds fucking ill in like multiple senses of the word uh and i don't really think i've seen anyone talk about it in like some of the reviews that i've read but this shit is like even lyrically like the sentiment of a room full of eyes like it reminds me of another particular lyricist that i can't think of but it's very like horror-esque and and kind of disturbing and disgusting and yet the rest of the lyrics are again kind of like evoking a, a societal even economic kind of um dystopia like there is a price to pay on the last day i'll play turn your eyes uh i guess we'll make a way this isn't healthy to do i hope we can find another way until we die we're never satisfied we lust for and feed the dissatisfaction of want and need little honey i needed a reminder from you there sure ain't nothing like the sight of your fine skin from across the room the way that he takes like uh, again, like images of the human body, like skin and eyes, and like takes them like apart from a, a person and just sort of 
uh, disembodies them and, and makes them kind of horrific and scary. And I, it's a nice little way of like hinting at the commodification of people in the very materialistic world, right? By taking aspects of the human form and making them kind of like horrific and disembodied. Um, it's a lot of, it's what a lot of great sort of body horror filmmakers do as well. Um, so yeah, love that aspect of it. And the other deep cut I want to shout out, probably top three on the album for me is I Wouldn't If You Didn't, uh, which is just so fucking mind melting by the time you get to the finale of this track. It brings back the piano for the midsection of this song, again, which you also had in Widower. You have these gorgeous arpeggiated guitar pickings and a finale that showcases the band at their absolutely storming best. There's almost a ceremonious tone to Greg's singing on this song, just like kind of regal and tuneful and sweeping until the song lurches into its devastating final section where Greg is just screaming, suffering is love over and over and over. I mean, God, this album, like for all of the moments of beauty and just mournful sadness, this album just radiates. Like it also, again, doesn't forget to have some of their most blistering shit ever. So in the wake of Option Paralysis, despite the fact that this was sort of self-released and sort of had a little bit less ceremony for the band because of the less kind of label backing than their previous records, it did do particularly well. Uh, there was a, the band received a Golden God Award from Revolver Magazine for Best Underground Band. Um, and they had a much more successful tour than they've had in previous touring cycles. Uh, I believe in 2011, they toured with Deftones for a while, which, I mean, imagine imagine catching that. Just imagine yeah. catching Dillinger touring Option Paralysis with Deftones touring Koino Yokan. Just, like, Fuck process. Fuck me sideways. Well, they would have been toy, to, they would have been Diamond Dies. Diamond Dies then, but, you know. Uh, probably, I mean. <laughs> those two records are pretty close together anyway. Um, uh, anyway. You know. If I, I can't imagine that for very long because I'll have to go lie down. Yeah. So then we have their first studio album arriving with surprisingly little ceremony in 2013, I believe. One thing worth noting is that guitarist Jeff Tuttle left the band uh, between the release of Option Paralysis and the recording of their next record. Um, and so... One thing that's interesting about the recording process and the release process of 2013's One of Us is the Killer is that it arrived with comparatively little ceremony for this band. They essentially announced the title about a month before or a couple of months before the record was released. They released a couple of singles, but then eventually the album came out in May of that year. And I mean, we've danced around it a little bit up until this point, but I think that most fans of Dillinger and the Escape Plan can prob would probably either agree or probably would understand why we're about to say that this is pretty unquestionably the band's high watermark. I mean, do either of you have anything ranked above it? I think, do we all have this as the number one? This is more like number, number one of us time. the killer. All right, oh, okay. shit. I wasn't sure if anyone was going to come at with a surprise hot take uh, on their number one album on the list but yeah no this is just what's interesting about like this being their best album uh, at least from my perspective is that it's maybe the most single-minded dillinger escape plan album in the sense that like a lot of their records up until this point showcase all of these different shades of the band and all of these different like sonic templates and palettes and like different things they can integrate whereas one of us is the killer from start to finish without any exception purely exists to murder you like I mean, one of us is, the killer is dillinger escape plan they are the, the they killer are the, is greg pucciato the killer is yeah. um, greg pucciato like there is an imposter among us don't don't know why they say that yeah that was regrettable and while on the face of it that should like make this record sound like oh it's maybe dillinger escape plan in a more simplistic mode it's maybe Dillinger Escape Plan doing less of the kind of variation that we've come to love from them no <laughs> but the reality of it is that these songs are so good the band are so locked in and I think maybe more crucially the band are so singular in their vision like more so than they've ever been before that 
it's kind of addictive and it's kind of impossible to turn away. And it is the fastest <laughs> record of theirs from front to back, even if it's not the absolute shortest, it's the one that just flies by the most. It's the one that feels the most like perfect in terms of just like nailing a very particular thing and then treating a line where they continue to nail that thing over and over and over again without feeling like you're just getting the same song again and again and again and again. You have some of the best hooks the band have ever laid down to tape. You have some of the best riffs and song construction the band have ever laid down to tape. You have just one of the coolest overall aesthetics and production on any of their album ever, like genuine weight, but also crispness. Like a lot, you could say a lot of things about production on previous Still and Escape Plan records, maybe they're always well produced in my opinion, but they're always, they have a distinct kind of production identity that the band were on with Steve Everts that sometimes is a little bit more sort of intense and sort of, I don't want to say like brick walled because that's not true, but like just loud in terms of production and mixing. But this is one where I think this is maybe the most accessible record in terms from a production standpoint that the band made. It's a very great record to get into the band with if you want a relatively easy entry and you want to see why this band are as well regarded as they are. And it's kind of just an easy pick for Masterpiece because it feels like this is really the only time in their entire discography where they just fully commit to doing one singular thing aesthetically and doing it at 100 and never backing down. It is absolutely intoxicating and it's just a wild ride that I can't get enough of. Yeah, I heard this for the first time in like... I because I went through the discography in order, uh, so and I heard this one of us is the killer for the first time, and I want to say April, March or April of last year, and I've listened to the album all the way through once a week, every week since then at least. Um, <laughs> like, addicting is an appropriate word because the fucking on your hands and knees so you can take none of us have ever done crack and we don't don't know me because because (laughs) yes i yes i fucking do just we've none of us have ever done crack and we don't need to because when I lost my bet is more addictive <laughs> and it's better. Yeah. It's I, uh, and no. <laughs> oh god. And like talk about a consistent record in that sense, because every song is like that. <laughs> yeah. Like uh, the only metal record I like more than this is Opeth Still Life. And even then, like, mm, I mean, I? Like, those those are like so different from each other that you can pretend they're not even the same genre, really. Like, genuinely, the appeal is so different. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's just that you go to each of those records for a very different experience. Like, um, and, and this, yeah, this is like the first. Uh, and this is not to take away from the rest of the record at all. I, I, make that clear but the first five tracks on this album is like the best run of successive music this band ever laid down and the one of the best runs of music on any metal record that i can think of in terms of like five successive songs that are, are heavily have their own individual ideas are unified by a sonic aesthetic and let me be absolutely clear have fucking hooks for days days after days days. like nest aren't you (laughs) yes um nothing's ever fun and nothing's funny the the title track here one of their most enduring singles one of their catchiest songs like the the definition of a perfect alternative metal track like 100 out of 100 and let's be clear, like, this is an alt metal song. It has that mappy sort of progressive um, sound to it. But, like, if you were to make a list of the greatest sort of alt metal songs of all time, 
the title track on this record would have to be in the top five in my opinion yes it is simply perfect and what's crazy is that it's sandwiched between these songs that have a similar sense of catchiness but are much heavier overall and it feels completely like this is the thing about listening to this record is that you don't necessarily identify songs apart from each other while you're listening to it. It's just one continuous experience. One of the coolest moments in the entire discography is when Prancer finishes and when I lost my bet starts and you, and the songs just kind of roll into each other Mm -hmm. and you're just kind of like the energy never flags at all, not even for a split second. And Prancer, to be clear, is like, I mean, that's how you fucking open an album, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. That is my second favorite Dillinger Escape Plan song. I have listened to it more than any other song from this band because, I mean, th- this is like the best opening. Like, again, the rest of the song ain't nothing to fucking sneeze at or anything. But the first, like, opening seven seconds of Prancer are like my favorite opening seven seconds of any metal song ever because you just sort of get that opening like it's just insanely shrill of just the like it sounds like this is like you are playing a guitar with a knife that you dipped in lava and you're going and it's just like what the fuck is that sound and then you get just the absolutely fucking ridiculous opener of the how could it all be and then the fucking riff which is so good and like it, like this this song and every other song on this album are so dynamic that like i can only second riley's notion of it just like i don't really like when you say like the first five songs like yeah you're right but also it's like the first seven for me because like it's not like the eighth song is like lesser or anything but like that's like the epitome of like this feels like a movement that just doesn't stop happening and these songs like th- this is sort of why like I feel like they sort of took the template of a lot of the parts of Ironworks and kind of elaborated on that and sort of the like the 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 progressions and the structure of these tracks are so dynamic that they kind of elude structure altogether and just exist of being like an excuse to get to the next vocal hook or the next like beat down like I mean I think the end of one of us is the killer is just one of the best moments on this entire album this entire discography and you get into a song like the deep cuts on here you get fucking paranoia shields which is one of my favorite songs on here it begins with the which is the gnarliest guitar tone you've ever heard in the world and then you get the fucking like the insane insanely underrated cross burner which oh, like you you need to strap in for this song number and one you, you that's fucking number that's, one that's fucking right i i can't like i don't even share that opinion but i feel like spiritually i do and like not to mention this is like thematically Dillinger's most like impressive accomplishment thus far to me because it sort of distills all of the sort of like one of my favorite things is just the whole one of us is the killer notion the uh you know but the other won't survive the sort of notion of like being so embroiled in a toxic relationship that no matter who does the killing both of you are dead anyway and that like it's so stark and bleak and it's just this recount of like constant evolving fluctuating toxicity and misery and anger and hate and you're just you know you're screaming you're fucking you're hitting you're it's 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 nothing but distilled id and somehow it doesn't sacrifice that for also being dillinger's catchiest record by far i don't know how that alchemy works i don't understand how they were able to make an accomplishment like this of how it's like the the poppiest album that they have ever made and simultaneously the one that makes me feel the most punished mm-hmm. it's it's just a it's an infinitely addicting album i mean this is this is crack rock cocaine in its purest form there is nothing about this album that is weak it is a 100 out of 100 record and it is the epitome of basically everything that makes this band great for all of this talk of it being like one of the greatest metal records ever, one of the, a discussion, on, and just to lead off of what you were saying, a discussion I don't see it brought up in enough, 
uh, is that it's one of the greatest breakup albums ever as well. Yes. Like, um, yeah, 100%. that is the, the core subject matter of this record. And if the album is the most singular in their discography in terms of a focus on a particular aesthetic sonically and not deviating away from that, it's also the most elegantly simple album conceptually yes. and thematically as well. Like it is just about, as you say, it is about pure unbridled and broiling hatred within a relationship, a relationship falling apart of mutual destruction as well, mutually assured destruction. Like you're in a relationship where each of you are like equally toxic and bringing each other down. And that notion of like mutual destruction is why talking I love... about fe- talk about fucking like a nuclear war. Am I well, right? Yeah, uh, I mean that let's... notion of mutually assured destruction is why I love the title, the not title, but the closing track so much. The threat posed by threat nuclear posed weapons, by nuclear war. because like it completely, you have to make that association internally because the song doesn't make that metaphor particularly clear. But like, yeah, it, it, essentially in the context of the album, you have a relationship that is so emotionally devastating that the impact on you is comparable to a nuclear war. And it is like, it's incredibly it's comparable the to Deftones ohms, if I'm being perfectly honest, a lot of the same shit, a yeah. lot of the same appeal as well. Like that, this wow. album and that album are kindred spirits, in my opinion. That's a, I, that's actually a really cool comparison. I would not have thought of that, but. Yeah, they both have a similar feel in terms of like the kind of record that they are in the band's discography, uh, the refinement, but also the subject matter for for sure. Like, God and damn. They, this needed to build from option paralysis is like stark bleakness too, to be able to capture this as effectively. It's like, you know, th- this it's like their whole career up until this point was them just shitting masterpieces to be able to build to this as the the sort of monument thus far to what is essentially in my opinion would be their like you know this is their ride the lightning you know this is the 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 concise but without you know sacrificing anything it's like this is just it's I so think of it definitive as, i often think about this band in relation to death and this is I their too. symbolic mm-hmm. sure yeah. is yeah jake made that comp earlier about how they have similar i forgot to mention in the actual segment as well like there are multiple albums i think you can where you can draw connections between not necessarily in terms of quality but more in terms of like what an album represents in a discography and like option paralysis is their like spiritual healing not in terms of quality again but in terms of like being the most kind of like socio-politically topical record and maybe the most divisive i guess based on ratings and like Calculating Infinity is like what kind of their, I don't even know if Scream Bloody Gore is an appropriate comparison, but there is a kind of sheer primitivism in those records. Yes, I think so. And um, yeah, and then like Miss Machine is a, is like a, a really effective sort of leap procedure stand in where that primitivism is kind of paired back a bit, but the heft is still there. And yeah, and eventually you get to uh, these last two records in each band's discography. And yeah, we'll get to the last one in just a second. You guys want to rate this or anything else you guys want to add? We have the least to say about it precisely because it's the most perfect. I feel like that sort of, it's almost like anticlimactic, right? Because you spend like, not only do the band spend like building their, you know, their acumen and their their thematic core, their sound, and they build to one of us is the killer, right? And then you get there and it almost feels anticlimactic that that's not the end, right? And it almost feels anticlimactic that we have to talk about it, even though I'm sure we all have at least slightly positive thoughts on it. So allow me to inject a little bit of uh, vitality into this discussion and that I was intentionally quite uh, silent when Riley asked us what our favorite Dillinger Escape Plan album is, is because this is mine. Dissociation. It, it was, yes, Dissociation, 2016's Dissociation is my favorite Dillinger Escape Plan album. Wasn't always. Um, one of Us is the Killer was for wow. up until like maybe a week and a half ago, really. It's it's also funny just because this is the first album from them I actually ever heard. I listened to this when I went through 2016 albums when I first got into music and I was just kind of like, I don't know what the fuck this is. I was like, I, 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 this is, this is not for me right now. And I was probably right to, to, to put that aside just because it's a pretty bad place to start in terms of Dillinger Escape Plan albums. And look, I mean 
everything I say about One of Us is the Killer and that I still think that that's probably the, the totem of this and that it's the most emblematic of the band. It's probably the most perfect and all. But in terms of what I get out of the experience of Dillinger Escape Plan albums, this is the one that I feel the most. This is the one that makes me feel the most. And as much as I like, I, I do partially agree with Morgan's assessment on uh, option paralysis being basically like the, the, the darkest and the most hopeless. Like I, I, that's probably my second pick. Dissociation on the other hand is in my opinion, the darkest Dillinger escape plan album. And it's because, well, I mean, it's like option paralysis title. It's dissociation is basically like, it's almost a an opposition to one of us is the killer is that you sort of have the albums in this discography being variations on a theme of you know the toxicity of a relationship uh namely being one and this is sort of an album where the thematic core of it and the character or greg or whatever you want to call it comes to the conclusion that dissociation from like just numbness and ultimately death uh, separation via death is the only way out. Like this is the this is the the single minded fixation on escape, and then coming to the conclusion that there either is no escape or that your death is the only solace you will find from this. And the band gets so much mileage out of that. I I, I don't want to like jump the gun here too hard, but dissociation contains the vast majority of my favorite Dillinger Escape Plan songs, precisely because this is one of the best swan song albums for any band ever. Uh, not just because it's a good album, but because of the approach here is that Dillinger Escape Plan are making this album like it is the last album they, were ev they will ever make. And by all intents and purposes, that seems to be the case. They had every intention of making this album their last. And when you listen to it, that's what it sounds like. They are going so hard on all of their influences, all of the genres that they have taken after. It's on display even more starkly than it was before. You can hear Deftones influence all over this album and more like wide circles of alt metal. You can hear jazz fusion on this album on stuff like one of the album highlights for me, Lofield's Boulevard, which I mean is straight up jazzy. Uh, and if, if like, number one is Crossburner, Low Fields Boulevard is number two. It is 100% up there that far for me as well. Uh, along with a lot of other tracks on here, I think that Prancer is definitely the best Dillinger Escape Plan opening, but Limerent Death, on the other oh. hand, is a close oh. second place for me because this is like, like, if I can describe this as in one word it's overwhelming is that even when you adjust yourself to the other albums is the reason this took the longest to grow on me is precisely because this is like save for calculating infinity which is this for different reasons entirely is that this is an album of density this is an album that is just so so compositionally unfriendly i mean take something like uh wanting not so much as to which is just like what an ugly fucker of a song. The time signatures here, they like the the wall of noise that this shit is. Is that this is an album that packs so much into these mixes that it like th these mixes are leaded. This is this is nuts. Like one of us is the killer is a sharp album. That's an album that has precision. It's a fucking. It, it's like throwing a knife at a dartboard and this is just a nuclear fucking bomb uh which you know uh, ha -ha yeah. i mean if, that, if but... the closing track on one of us is the killer is the threat posed by nuclear weapons then here we have fat the man threat dropping is... on nagasaki <laughs> the threat is fully fulfilled and like there there's just a point where i just kind of had to surrender myself to the unfriendly is here because there is so much going on in these tracks and in these songs that it feels overwhelming and there are so many ideas here that it feels like it could burst apart at the seams and you know maybe it does but that's the thing is that this is sort of the ironworks effect but taking all of these idiosyncratic ideas and fleshing them out into fully formed products and my god 
what an assembly of products we have here. I already said Limerent Death is like, it also has some of the catchiest vocal hooks on there. It's just the fact that it is so warped and unfriendly sounding that it isn't quite the, the, the titanic achievement that Prancer is, but it's still perfect nonetheless, in my opinion. You go straight into something like Symptom of Terminal Illness, uh, which kind of mirrors the structure of oh, Us the Killer God, with the first three songs. Song. Symptom of Terminal Illness is just <laughs> one of like the most catchy songs, but it's also oh. one of the most dark and devastating songs that they've ever made like yeah. oh man this is so tangibly fucking ugly and like mean i i i don't even have words for some of this shit here because they know how to make something sound really really fucking bleak uh and let's just throw all cards on the table here this is this is basically a progressive metal album when you throw all it down to it. And if not even solely in genre, but in spirit, there is, of course, there you can track back the IDM influences to on Dillinger back to as far as calculating infinity. And naturally, so they decide to make an IDM song on here. They they just did that. It's it, which sounds like a fucking gnarled hell version of Square Pusher and Aphex Twin if they had an ugly fucking kid and it just like, you know, it goes hard for that first part and it becomes all that atmospheric and then it doubles up on the tempo at the end and just it's super shit, shit. fucking light period square pusher like you dig this listen to Square Pusher's 2010s albums. And then you go into Low Fields Boulevard, which again Dillinger escape plan does jazz fusion. That's like, that's not even like me being hyperbolic. That's actually what this song sounds like. It becomes I've, like loungy in parts. Like what I've the never fuck, been, man? I've never been more erect. I mean, the, so, the, the yes to all the jazz stuff, which is actually a big part of like what I have to say about this album is how jazzy mm. it is. But like the guitar solo in Low Fields Boulevard and the tone yeah. of the guitar, like I brought up Porcupine Tree before when we were DMing yep. about it. Like it reminded me of like a prog metal sort of guitar tone. And it's just like, it's so beautiful. It's so emotional. It's so evocative. It's so sad. In the context of this song, that is like straight up one of the most innovative songs in the entire discography. Like, come on. I, I I think there's Shout no shortage of John shit like McLaughlin that. and the Mahavishnu Orchestra. Yes, I believe uh -huh. they were cited as a specific influence. I think it was on this record specifically that the band, I think it was Ben that cited them as a huge um, influence. So yeah, you can see that. You um, feel it structurally too. Uh, Limerent Death, to go back to that real quick, one of my favorite moments in this discography is the final third of Limerent Death when it comes back and just does the first <sighs> part, but faster. And Fucking Greg black is... Metal. Greg is losing his mind. And it's like, uh, the, I mean, by the standards of Greg Pucciato, he's losing his mind. It's like, this man sounds like he was put into a tape recorder and sped up by four times, but he's actually just singing that fast. Full Mike Patton shit. And it's awesome. And then you have unwieldy, hellish songs like Surrogate. Oh my God. God, oh my God, this song is evil. It's disgusting. And it also has that like three act I structure that it. this album is so fond of. And yeah, it's, it's, it's like tasty, but also it's like, it has an aftertaste. that's just disgustingly bitter. And oh man. Can we, talk like, about, I, can we talk about how Honeysuckle is the hardest thing it, they made since Calculating oh, Infinity? I was, I'm so glad that's exactly what I was about to talk about because oh my fucking God, dude. I, it's, it sounds like it's on fire it's so cool oh, like God, it's good it like and even greg again it's just like he sounds like an alien on this song like it sounds like his vocals are almost i mean it sounds like that song on Saturday Night Wrist, the fucking Chino's black metal ass screams. I mean, that mm. that's more rats, or less rats, what Honeysuckle yeah, is. Yeah. Um, and then in Honeysuckle, it's just like, you get to a part and it's just like, blah, 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 do some Red King Crimson jazz shit. They're like, blah, 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 blah. So like what? <laughs> one of my favorite little details. Um, I, I uh, If you want more information about this, they, they uh, Ben Wyman and Greg Pucciato did an interview with Louder Sound where they broke down every song on this album. And there's a cool little production detail with this song where Pucciato talks about getting really frustrated doing the vocal recordings on this. Cause it's one of the most mm. difficult songs for him to record vocally. And there is like a take where he 
was so frustrated that he slammed the vocal, he slammed the door of his booth like wide open. And that sound is actually captured on the album uh, towards the end of the song. Uh, it's a bit, bit buried, but you can hear it if you're looking for it. And um, it's just like, there's this so much rawness in this, which is interesting because like overall in terms of texture and production, it's not like particularly one of the Aurora records. I would say it, it, in, in a lot of ways, it follows on from, one of us is the killer is like increased polish in terms of production mm -hmm. but um there is a rawness to the performances here that speaks to i think something that's already been said which is like the feeling of this band like not even playing like it's going to be their last album but like fully conscious of the fact that this is how we want to bow out like you say jake this is one of the great swan song records and it's always a great swan song record is always particularly great when the band are conscious of that fact like when they yes. know that they're going into this intending to create something that fully sort of summarizes uh, and brings full circle uh, everything that they have done and the arc of their discography and it, and it puts this perfect bow on the entire story and uh, what I li like and appreciate about that is that this is even though this isn't like one of my absolute favorite Dillinger records yet who fucking knows it's probably the one I've spent the least time with but what I love about it is that in making this career summary record and making this kind of like bowing out record, they make one of their most like experimental, one of their most varied, one of their most like all over the place in terms of like sonic aesthetic and, and the things that they try to do within these tracks. And they don't play it safe. They don't make like the simple unadorned album to kind of bow out on. They are extra as fuck on this album. And the Linder Escape Plan at their best are extra as fuck. They're over the top. In many ways, like one of Us as the Killer is their least extra album. Like it's their most focused, it's yeah. their most singular, which is why I like the way this pairs with it as like a yes. less, as a more kind of cluttered, a less focused counterpoint that as a result loses some points with me. But like I get it gains points in terms of my respect for what this album is in terms of the place it represents in this discography, in terms of what it does and the context of the record that precedes it. It's just super exciting and invigorating and like full of ideas. And it shows you that this is not a band bowing out because they're tired. It is a band bowing out before they get tired. It is a band bowing out while they still have all of the power and all of the ferocity and all of the innovation and vision that they've always had. And speaking of bowing the fuck out two of my top five favorite dillinger escape plan songs are the final two songs on this album the final well, two are pretty first great. of all apologies not included is ferocious uh just as good however nothing to forget is a song that begins with this muscular watery electric guitar that just sounds like nothing they've ever played with before and you have Greg just sort of like, you know, first part of it's like a normal Dillinger song. And then as it keeps going, get to the part where it's just like, your fingers around my neck. And then when he starts doing the like, I need to be by myself. When he's trying to get away from all of this, he sounds contorted. He sounds demonic. He's like, it's it's creaky and eeky and wiry and weird. And he's just trying to separate himself from it. And it's so fucking intense atmospherically. And the song just kind of comes apart until the very forlorn vocals in the third half, or the third half, the final third, where the strings also get really, really intense and feverish and the song just kind of builds and builds. And then we end on the title track, Dissociation, which is my favorite Dillinger Escape Plan song, which is basically a microcosm of why this is my favorite album from them, which is just, God, this song is devastating. This song is so fucking emotional. It begins with these weepy violins that just, the string section that just sounds fucking heartbreaking it's like i'm listening to the soundtrack of like a portrait of a lady on fire or something it's like what the fuck and you have this sort of moment of where it's just like you know it's simultaneously a great way 
to close all of the themes that they've been talking about across the records and kind of a meta thing as a band like to say you know that you know they're bowing out they're dying here and they're finding some kind of contentment in it but you know they've separated themselves from the nexus of violence and sex and suffering and toxicity and the only way out is to die and the song just has so many different passages it's just it's this entire album epitomized in one song and it does so concisely but also in a way that feels incredibly vast and it's just it's always an exciting album to listen to once you finally fully get on its wavelength and these experiments that they're doing they aren't just doing because they're cool I mean they're definitely partially doing it because they're cool but they're all doing it because they work this flows so phenomenally well together. And once you get to that final part, it's just, it's so, especially when, after you listen to these albums in order, it's very satisfying, but a really grim kind of dark way. You just kind of close all of this out. You get the simultaneous feeling of just like, I don't know if I'm meant to feel more depressed or relieved. And I never really know which one I favor walking away from it. And it's the one that, lasts with me the most as a result it's the one that lingers and stays and like it excites me but also it's like I feel something from it in a way that I don't with like most metal albums it's it's so focused on being definitive and being the end for all of this and as a result it just it's it's magical I I I adore it it's it, I'm I'm so glad that I got on its wavelength fully because I always loved it but there was always something about it that just felt so scattershot or something but the the through line of it is maintained so well that I feel like the it, it's just it just has really good variety in a nutshell it's like once you sort of break yourself in for Dillinger this is just par for course man mm. yeah one thing I'll say is I said the first five tracks on one of us the killer is my favorite five track run on a Dillinger record uh, and before today, my favorite three track run was the last three on Ironworks. And that has since been surpassed by the first three on this record, which oh, yeah. are That's just good the best three successive tracks, like in isolation, that, that this band ever put on a record. Like Limmer and Death, I don't need to add anything. It's my second favorite opener after Goodbye, Mona Lisa. And it farewell Mona Lisa whatever and it might overtake that frankly it's very close like I love how unhinged and just purely horrified this song sounds it's genuinely sp I get fucking goosebumps listening to it it's upsetting this and one of us the killer are the most emotionally like tonally effective albums to me like they they have captured the essence of emotion with their sound so well on these two albums yeah, I think it's a wise move to kind of like lean further into that as their career goes on more and more and more. And it gives these last two albums in particular this really personal feeling that I think fits the band really well in this kind of like swan song era of their career. Uh, and, and nowhere is, I don't think anywhere in this discography is uh, Greg Pucciato more personal than on the song Symptom of Terminal Illness, which he said is the most like, unguarded and undressed up and unabstract set of lyrics that he's ever written he had talks about his experience with panic disorder and the experience of having a panic attack the experience of living in perpetual state of anxiety uh and it's quite like if you just read the lyrics apart from the song like it looks like very sort of blunt and straightforward and almost kind of like uh maybe too like almost like too like unpoetic for this band but like the way they're delivered the way they're rendered like the directness really makes them a lot more powerful like there's something really just humbling about hearing the man Greg Pucciato who we've heard like being this force of nature across so many albums say a line like I'm frightened in sleep thinking my world will be gone like he just strips away all of any facade of sort of strength that you might think any facade of like you know formidableness and he just becomes this vulnerable little boy and it's so heartbreaking it, it, it's un just it's it's a lot to deal with and it's 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 again one of the many things that are so surprising about this album uh, i think wanting's not so much to as to 
which is a bit of a mouthful, is one of the more underrated songs on this album, although I'm sure you could probably point to a bunch that are underrated. But what I liked about this song is like it really makes the jazzier elements of this record in terms of like percussion and, and musical construction more pronounced uh, before you get uh, Lowfield's Boulevard as well, which does that even more so. There's also like this weird sort of slint-esque quality to this song that only really like hit me uh, listening to it the last time like there's a spoken word-esque section on this track that's recorded uh, in a way that reminded me a lot of Spiderland and just generally there's a doomy feel to it um, but that's also like complemented by some of the most unfriendly musical musicality of this record as well like it's a genuinely upsetting song in a different way that the last song is upsetting as well like it's just really really striking um, my one hot take I guess on this record is that I don't really care for Fugue. Uh, it's a neat little experiment but I do feel like the record to, for me would be more powerful if wanting not so much to as to went into Low Fields Boulevard um, because those two songs are so unified in certain ways to me. Um, but I'm not mad that Fugue exists. It's pretty cool. It's um, like man's yeah. heard man's heard that Fugue was not a favorite and bounced. Did he? Oh, okay. I wasn't looking at the Zoom. There he is. I didn't see. I didn't see that protest. But you oh, know. I'm sorry. I, I I was just hearing some shit. My computer must have been broken. I I just had to join the call and make sure everything was fine. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's you know, um, but yeah, the rest of the album is great. And um, yeah, I think I agree with Jay that it yeah. finishes particularly strongly with those last two tracks. I might even like nothing to forget slightly more than the title track, but they're both brilliant um there is again like some pure signature greg kind of just devastation in the way that he says please let me be by myself i don't need anything like even the first time i heard this record that was one of the moments on this record that really like stuck out in my memory uh, i like as well that weinman described it as uh the best faith no more song we ever wrote which is really funny because it's, it's not that faith no more-esque but i can also hear what he said what he means when when he says that and then yeah closing track it's a i mean it's the kind of swan song that you you write that you make when you want to bow out of a whole fucking career um it doesn't not so much in sound but like thematically in terms of the lyricism that referred to like being in the car and sort of traveling and and uh isolation and leaving in a relationship uh i was reminded somewhat spiritually of heart attack and lay by by porcupine tree but it very much has its own thing. Uh, it all is, roads lead back to Stephen Wilson. Yeah, all roads do. Uh, it, it's it's gut wrenching. I mean, shit. I don't have much to say about it. The lyrics are kind of the ceremonious ending feel. I like the fact that the song apparently has a melody that Pucciato had kept in his back pocket since he was a teenager. So he ended up and ended up using it on this final song of their final album. <laughs> Just um, on a napkin in his back pocket. He's just like, oh, fucking shit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and also it has a drum loop uh, where like it was built around a drum loop that was given to them by Zach Hill of Hella and Death Grips, which is a cool little connection. It's just uh, a really great record, uh, a really deserving swan song for a band that have continually won up to themselves and proven themselves to be more than worthy of all timer status. I, I love this. A couple of things worth noting uh the band played their very last show on the 29th of december 2017 in new york with code orange and daughters as the supporting bands Fuck um me. it's worth noting that nobody left alive it's worth noting <laughs> that in survivors. their last shows in several of their last shows the band were rejoined by dimitri minakakis who oh. played mm -hmm. on stage and played and sang along with several um of their songs most memorably he sang alongside with Pucciato when they played an encore performance of 43 percent burnt which is just kind of i beautiful. bet that was stupid there, there there are some videos of that yeah i, I oh, i'm gonna look at that up check that out i mean a number of former members actually joined the band on their last few shows uh brian benoit their one of their first guitarists rejoined them uh, original bassist adam dole who hadn't played on a project i don't think actually plays on any studio albums but played in the band during their early first period in their live performances uh, and probably on their first couple of eps as well played keyboards on the title track in their last show 
uh, the title track of Dissociation, rather, in their last show. And yeah, and, and then they bowed out on their own terms and quite beautifully. But yeah, that's the discography of Dillinger Escape Plan. As is customary before we wrap these up, let's do our album rankings and our favorite tracks. Morgan, since you are on a bit of a time pressure, why don't you go first and do your favorite tracks countdown or do your album ranking first and then your favorite tracks countdown. All right. So counting irony is a dead scene. Uh, number seven total projects. We have Ironworks. Number six, Calculating Infinity. Number five, Irony is a Dead Scene. Four, Miss Machine. Three, Option Paralysis. Two, Dissociation. And one, One of Us is the Killer. Uh, I have drawn up a top 25 songs uh, because oh, yeah. this, this is the only band in which I will be an overachiever. Number 25, Prancer. 24, Endless Endings. 23, Hero of the Soviet Union. 22, Parasitic Twins. 21, The Running Board. 20, Pig Latin. 19, Sunshine the Werewolf. 18, Limerent Death. Uh, 17, Symptom of Terminal Illness. 16, Paranoia Shields. 15, Jim Fear. 14, Mouth of Ghosts. 13, Honeysuckle. 12, One of Us is the Killer. 11, 43% Burnt. 10, Black Bubble Gum. 9, Unretrified. 8, Dissociation. 7, Widower. 6, Setting Fire to Sleeping Giants. 5, When Good Dogs Do Bad Things. 4, When I Lost My Bet. 3, Farewell Mona Lisa. 2, Low Fuels Boulevard. And 1, Crossburner. And if I hadn't made it clear through this video as of now the dillinger escape plan is my favorite band of all time so uh there you go from the bottom up we have for the discography counting irony is dead scene we have seven ire works six irony is a dead scene five calculating infinity four option paralysis three miss machine two one of us is the killer one dissociation and my top 10 songs uh honorable mention goes to mouth of ghosts uh, 10, The Perfect Design, 9, Dead is History, 8, One of Us is the Killer, 7, Low Fields Boulevard, 6, Weekend Sex Change, 5, Sunshine the Werewolf, 4, Nothing to Forget, 3, Widower, 2, Prancer, 1, Dissociation. So my album ranking, is, including Irony of the Dead Scene, is as follows. Uh, number 7 is Calculating Infinity. Number six is Irony is a Dead Scene. Number five is Miss Machine. Number four is Dissociation. Number three is Option Paralysis. Number two is Ire Works. And number one is, of course, One of Us is the Killer. And my top 10 songs list, uh, I'll do one honorable mention as well, since you did my honorable mention, and I'm fucking heartbroken that I could not get this on the list, uh, Symptom of Terminal Illness. Um, number 10, Sunshine the Werewolf. Number nine, When Good Dogs Do Bad Things. Number eight, Low Fields Boulevard. Number seven, One of Us is the Killer. Number six, Limerent Death. Number five, Farewell Mona Lisa. Number four, Widower. Number three, I've cheated because fuck you. And it's Prancer and mm -hmm. When I Lost My Bet together because they, Hell go, yeah. they go together. Fuck you. It, I, I don't care. That's my number three, Prancer and When I Lost My mm -hmm. Bet. Number two, Black Bubble Gum. And number one, Mouth of Ghosts. Yeah, Dillinger Escape Plan may have goated. They may have, they may have, they may have done that. Um, but... If you're still with us at home, we want to hear from you. Let us know what your favorite songs and your favorite albums are from Dillinger Escape Plan. Let us know what this band means to you. Let us know if you think that we missed anything important in our interpretations or our discussions of the significance of any of these albums or of this band or anything at all. Obviously, we were limited in the things that we could mention as well. We wanted to make this actually watchable slash listenable. So 
Uh, we couldn't necessarily cover every little nook and cranny and detail of their story. So let us know anything you think we should know in the comments below. If you like what we do, then please consider subscribing to the channel. And uh, if you're on YouTube, please consider liking the video. If you're listening to this on a streaming service, give us a five-star rate and review. Really makes a difference. Those things are really small, but they really do actually help us an awful lot. We have done previous discography videos on a whole host of bands, including metal bands such as Death and Opeth, as we have mentioned, and Deftones as well. All of those are available on our YouTube channel. You can go and check those out. Uh, really proud of those videos. This is a, a worthy addition to the canon, frankly. And we will be doing more as well in the future. This will not be the last metal discography that we cover. Don't worry about that. If you want to support us above and beyond just those little things, then hitting the join button on our YouTube page and spending just one buck a month to support us actually really helps a huge amount. And you get particular perks for it as well, such as priority comment responses. We, If you want to recommend us music, then we'll give it priority if you're a member of the family. And also you get your name mentioned in the intro scroll on every video on our YouTube channel as well. So if you want to support us for just a buck, there's that option as well. But yeah, thanks so much for sticking with us if you're still here. And thanks for listening to yet another awesome discography breakdown. We're really thrilled to finally have been able to do this. As always, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, public enemies, America's most wanted. <laughs>